Oh, oh. how about that? Good. Uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll read it. Good morning and welcome to our November 29th Indian River Lagoon Council Board of Directors meeting. We're going to call to order this morning and begin with the Pledge of Allegiance, if you'll please stand. I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, and a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, when uh, fellow board members, if you'd like to speak, please press the button on your microphone to activate it. And we are going to start with our introductions of board members, and we'll start down with you, Aaron. Good morning, Aaron Watkins, Director, uh, Central District DEP. Good morning, Jackie Thurlow Lippish, Governing Board, South Florida Water Management District. Good morning, Susan Adams, Indian River County Commission. Good morning, I'm Stacy Heatherington, Martin County Board of County Commissioners. Good morning, Jeff Brower, Volusia County Chair. Good morning. Good morning, Kirk Smith, County Commissioner. Doug Bornick, St. John's River Water Management District. Okay, I would like to also, um, we have a couple members that are not able to be with us today that are listening in. We have our EPA partners um, who are unfortunately are still not able to travel due to COVID. But on the line, we have Vince Bacalone from the EPA headquarters. Hope I didn't butcher your name, Vince. And Jennifer DeMeo and Wade Lehman from the EPA Region 4. So welcome and thanks for joining us this morning. So uh, on our agenda, I don't have any revisions. Are there any um, board members that have revisions for the agenda? With that, I will take a motion to approve the agenda. Move, it, move approval of the agenda as presented. I'll second it, please. Okay. Thank you. We have a motion by um, Commissioner Adams and seconded by Jackie Thurlow Lippish. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much. And as far as our resolutions and recognitions, we don't have any awards today, but uh, we understand that Lane Hamilton, who is the project leader and refuge manager at U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for Merritt Island National Wildlife Refuge, we understand she's retiring, and we want to, on behalf of all of our Indian River Lagoon Council board members, uh, thank Lane for her service on the um, NEP, and we appreciate your leadership. So thank you, Lane. Okay, uh, moving on to public comment. We have one um, speaker form. If you would like to um, speak, then please fill out a speaker form and I will call you. Our first speaker is Robert Stephen. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for letting me speak, everybody. My name is Bob Stephen. I live here in Sebastian. I live on a, a big waterway that up in the Heights. Been here for about six or seven years. Been following this water movement since I got here. I had no idea what to think about it, but I started following Dwayne and his people, and you're all here in this meeting for quite a few years. So I kind of got a gist of what's going on. I was a car mechanic mainly for most of my life and then taught for 20 years for the state of New Hampshire, automotive technology. So I wasn't a scientist or even an environmentalist to speak of, but I was. And um, we were project managers. When we had problems, the manufacturers would just so you got to fix it. And they would give us tick codes to override warranty situations and just fix the problem. That doesn't seem to be happening with our lagoon. I don't understand that. It's perplexed me to the point where I've wanted to move away from it, but now I'm having a hard time getting away. <laughs> but um, as long as we're poisoning our waterways, and we poison our waterways, this city puts thousands of dollars every month into poisons to kill grass. I don't see why we should put money into feeding those animals. They're all going to die. If, if We're killing everything. We're killing the habitat of our environment. Poisons and fertilizers, the wrong septic systems going into new houses. We can perk our own 
septic system in our front lawn if we do it right. But we can't help the animals if you're going to keep poisoning them. I live on this waterway. I see it. I've been watching it every year, every day. You've got to stop poisoning. It's bottom line. It's like David Attenborough says. If you've seen his videos, it's his, my life on Earth, and then the year Earth changed, you've got to see those two because it puts it into perspective for a simple little mind like mine. It's like, wow, this has got to get into our school systems. They need to be showing these two videos. I mean, this man's passionate and knowledgeable, and he will have you excited, crying, and at the end of his video is a little bit of hope. But the bottom line is, we've got to stop what we're doing. Just stop, period. Figure it, we'll figure it out. We can do it without the chemicals. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. Okay. Our water quality reports this morning. We're going to have um, Dr. Chuck Jacoby do the Northern and Central Lagoon. Good morning. Good morning. Feels like a Friday. <laughs> um, I wish it was. Yeah, indeed. right? <laughs> well, I was getting ready this morning thinking, oh, it's Especially Friday. And I thought, wait, no, that's not true. Following a long weekend, too. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Hang on, we're getting there. That's good. Oh, okay. You want Diane to go first? It's the uh, other, the southern one first. Come back. You want to do the southern? Yep. Sorry, stay right there. <laughs> we want to readjust the slide. Do we have do we have the slides for northern you, and central? We do not have chucks. But we have. We can always skip the first. Which button am I? Pushing? Okay, so we're going to um, move up our Southern Lagoon report by Diane Hughes from Martin County. Welcome, Diane. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Hope you all had a wonderful uh, Thanksgiving holiday. Thanks. Well, I put together this report last Monday. So that's where Lake Okeechobee was at, at 1607 feet last Monday, and we had some water come out of the S80. We've had a lot of rain in our own C44 basin where I live. Um, and yeah, our <coughs> west coast has a lot of water going out, as you can see there. These have been the salinity fluctuations that we have since January until now in November. We're finally getting up into uh, better levels of salinity right now in November. As you can see up there, we want to be more up near the 20s in our mid-estuary. And Terracoccus levels have been getting better since uh, the end of October. Um, these are levels. Uh, Leighton Park was a little bit high. That's mid-estuary. The Stuart Sandbar was around 10. And then on the bottom there, both our Jensen Beach and Stewart Causeways were in the good range it's on November 8th. I don't think they, oh, their last sampling event was on September 15th, but they didn't have results for the causeways. And staff have said that they can see all the way to the bottom of the um, river and the estuary. And the only other thing people had said they thought they saw seagrass, but it's large amounts of green and brown macroalgae on the bottom. That's all I have to report. Anybody have any questions or comments? Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Jacoby, is that is your report something that you can give without the slides, an overview? Yes. We apologize. We are missing some of um, Dr. Jacoby's weekend. slides, so he's going to give us a verbal. It's a holiday weekend. <laughs> um, yeah, so the lagoon has been pretty calm. The, for the past months since we last met. Um, temperatures were started to drop um, sort of in October, got down to around 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, they bumped back up a little bit in the last week or so, you know, with the sunshine and the calm weather. 
Uh, salinities have, have been not as extreme as we have seen um, in some of the past years. So mostly in the brackish range when we had the rain, um, some of those salinities are climbing a little bit now, going up into around the 30 mark, which is 35 is ocean. Um, and that's at the two extremes. So that's down in Vero Beach where you have the inlets, and then up in Mosquito Lagoon where you have a lot of evapotranspiration and the, the water becomes a little saltier. Um, the chlorophyll levels have been low, um, so mostly down around in the sort of 20 to 30 range at best. Um, there have been some spikes, uh, particularly around Coco and um, near Ogali, but uh, we had a lot of patchy blooms this sort of past summer um, where you would get uh, pyridinium, which is the dinoflagellate that bioluminesces, and they tend to occur in relatively small patches of blooms that move through past the sensors and so forth. So all in all, it was a pretty calm year for um, phytoplankton. And that means that the dissolved oxygen also has been pretty good. Um, there were a couple of days when it was cloudy and so forth that, you know, you started to see the daytime highs not get as high as they sometimes do because of the photosynthesis. So when it's cloudy, there's not as much photosynthesis and not as much oxygen produced. And that, <laughs> you, you sort of watch a stair step, but we didn't see it drop below two milligrams, which is the part that stresses aquatic life. So it's been a pretty quiet year. That's it. happy to ask the questions. Thank you. Anybody have any questions? The, the, this really is a little off point. Chuck, I've been studying for the citrus influence of salt on <clears throat> us. Northeast winds have been found to blow salt as much as 20 miles inland. And there's been, when you study the geology, because of that, the influence of that is, is significant. On the barrier island and in the lagoon, which is right there, um, do you see an increase in the salt content of the river on a, like a four or five day northeaster? Can, can do, yes. Yeah, and um, in fact, that may well be some of what's going on at Titusville, where right. the salinities are climbing a little bit. Yep. But, you know, that may just, like you say, just be that influence of this, yeah. the salt okay. wind. Yeah. Yes, Jack. Great. Jackie. Hello. Hey. Could you please talk a little bit about the algae blooms uh, all the way down from the, from the top to here, so to speak, and if there are none, just that there are none? or There what? have been um, a variety of, of patchy blooms reported. Um, in general, the cell counts are not as high. So in some of our really intense blooms, you know, we're looking at up to several million cells per milliliter. And these cell counts have more been in the tens of thousands, perhaps up to 100,000. So it's not like there are no phytoplankton out there. It's just not the sort of intense and widespread blooms that we've seen, say, back in the end of 2019 and early 2020. Do they usually subside in the winter? Like, yeah, like a colder weather usually, you know, calms things down, um, so that, that will help us. So the cool weather has, has definitely helped keep mm -hmm. phytoplankton a slow roar. I mean, for when we had, some, some of the intense blooms were in the winters when we had warm winters, when temperatures didn't mm -hmm. drop down into the 60s, you know, they stayed up in the 70s and even 80s. Uh, we've had some warm winters up this way. Have there been any fish kills and uh, are the fisheries healthy for the wildlife? Um, there, haven't, there haven't been any major fish kills at all. Um, there are always some fish kills reported, particularly with rainfall and back in canals, where you can get a situation with the fresh water and that comes in and then the DO will drop. And so the, you know, it's a, sort of an isolated kind of situation. But we haven't had any widespread fish kills this, since we last met, really. Can you speak on the manatees or is that a different uh, department? Uh, that, that would be the best information on manatees comes from FWC. So. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Doug, go ahead. Yeah, I, just, I got one more off the dartboard, Chuck. Um, we, have, we have dredged Manatee Paca. We have dredged Sebastian River. We have dredged Crane Creek. We have done a lot of dredging. Uh, we have stopped the C-54 discharges for now for three decades, primarily except for extreme situations. It seems like hopefully we've taken the biggest things we can find, both South Florida and St. John's and, and this council, and we've taken the low-hanging fruit so far. 
we have more work to do, to that gentleman's point. We still have a lot more fine tuning. But are you seeing any trends that are showing that what we've done is making a, an impact on a, on, a, on a large scale? Well, I mean, we, we certainly are seeing, you know, as you say, things like uh, the diversion of water back to the St. John's and, and, you know, that you can, we definitely can measure that load that's come off the lagoon as we're dredging likewise. And there's, you know, been a fair bit of work to follow up on just exactly how well this works. Um, right. Right. It doesn't necessarily work the first time through perfectly, right. but everybody expected you might have to come back and, you know, and, and do a cleanup job as it were. Um, it is possible, you know, that this past sort of year is, you know, maybe beginning to show some signs of, of the lagoon calming down. Um, the challenge with ecological systems is they often have kind of a lag, right. what's called a hysteresis. So we didn't see the lagoon tip over when we first started push, putting pressure on it. You didn't even necessarily see much of a change, but it gets to a kind of a point where it's just a little too much for too long and then it changes dramatically. And that's what we saw. And we're likely to see the same kind of thing with trying to push it back. You won't push it back up the same slope it came down on. You may have to push harder and get it, get the loads reduced further than where the drop occurred in order for the system to rebound. And so that's why, you know, I think that the key to everything is persistence, is just to stay with it. You know, I mean, even if you feel like you're not making progress, you are, but you just have to stay on, on focus and keep pushing back. Thank you. Thanks. I think that's a good message for today. Yes. I just want to take an opportunity to thank Chuck. Uh, many of you don't see the day-to-day -day interaction we have with the water management districts, DEP, FWC. And, and Chuck, this year, has been really carrying a lot on our behalf. And so every two weeks, he's convening uh, with us a Zoom meeting of all the water quality folks, all five counties, every state agency, you know, and, and Chuck keeps that kind of coordinated and we move through on almost a real time what's happening in the water. Uh, he's also been the senior editor on a, a special series of publications that we're partially funding through our program to get the information that has compiled from the 2011 Superbloom into peer review publication. So there's uh, 10 publications already been accepted, two are in review. I don't know how many more are coming, but Chuck, just want to thank you for all the support this year. Um, it's considerable and it's, it's regular. It's, it's like every week we're talking to, you know, to all the agencies, but Chuck has done a yeoman's job for us this year. So thanks, Chuck. You're welcome. I'll just write on the back, Kathy and Ashley. Thank you, Chuck. Appreciate it. Okay, we're going to now move on into our uh, management conference committee reports, and we'll start with Kathy LaMartina from the management board. Good morning, Kathy. Good morning. Happy Monday after Thanksgiving. <laughs> Uh, okay, so the management board met on November 16th, and uh, there were no revisions to our agenda. We approved the minutes and approved the finance subcommittee report. We had a couple of presentations that were kind of interesting. One was uh, from NASA, the Kennedy Space Center Indian River Lagoon Health Initiative Plan, and that's a plan that they've developed. Um, um, basically, you know, in partnership uh, to restore the lagoon. So that plan can be viewed on uh, their website, and we had a nice presentation about it, so it was pretty, pretty wonderful. Um, we also had a presentation on the importance of high-confidence data in geospatial analysis, and I believe you're having that presentation as well. That was a great project, really daunting. I really feel for... Uh, uh, Kirsten, who, who's doing, doing the project, and uh, we all realize that data consistency is almost more important than the data itself, actually. So you'll be hearing about that shortly. Regarding new business, the budget amendments, the communications plan, and the CCMP financing plans were all approved uh, by the management board. Um, uh, Wayne discussed a workforce analysis uh, 
to the board and that spurred a bit of discussion but the board definitely understands that more staff is needed to do all the work that the council's doing so you know we're in favor of that and we're also excited about additional federal funding that Duane brought to our attention regard, um, in relation to the legislative priorities. So the meeting uh, calendar was approved, and, and that's about it. So does anybody have any questions? Okay. Any questions? Jackie. Thank you. For the record, could you just give the highlights of the NASA presentation? Um, I, do, I don't have them in my notes, but it's basically what they've done is they're, they've put together a plan and it is, uh, it's called the uh, Indian River Lagoon Health Initiative Plan. Oh, okay, great. Right, so I Doug, know that. Doug I just think it, so, it's yeah. good since this is recorded and it's a big deal. I'm very grateful. Yeah. I mean, my gosh, to have them step in, maybe yeah. we can fix our problems. Yeah, you know, so, you know, and that's, that's a big that's area. So um, you know, there, it, it talks about the, you know, the causeways, et cetera, and just things that they're going to do to assist and partner with the council and, you know, the other agencies to. That's huge. Make sure. Thank it you. Is. I think that's super exciting. It is. I hope, uh, Dwayne, are they going to be getting that same presentation as the management board did? We could bring them in for a presentation. We couldn't schedule it today with the reschedule. Uh, what's interesting when you see the plan is that <clears throat> It, it showcases how much actual research is going on at Kennedy do. Space yeah. Center behind the scenes that the general public has no idea. So a really long database on CO2. They're working on fisheries, sea turtles, manatees, mm -hmm. seagrasses. And so this gives you a, a good look at the ongoing projects. And uh, the folks at uh, NASA have reached out to us and want to collaborate more in a, a direct fashion with projects to come. So we're talking about, many of you remember, we took over the atmospheric deposition station and uh, I may be jumping the gun a little bit, but it looks like we're gonna have some funding from Florida Atlantic University to maybe put two more stations in. So we're already having that discussion with NASA about putting a station up there for atmospheric deposition. So it's a it's a a really great step forward to you know see what they're doing up there and to see where we can collaborate. Yeah, and that spurred my memory a bit because they talked about they monitor everything, you know, and so they're they're looking at at what they've monitored, how long they've monitored like sea turtles and then what needs to be monitored like um one of them was horseshoe crabs, right? I think they were talking about horseshoe crabs and you know areas that uh, horseshoe crabs tend to go to. We should need, need to save them, et cetera. So it, it was very interesting. So I, th I think you guys should hear it. Doug. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, any river citrus used to be grown on the Cape. Hundreds and hundreds of acres uh, used to be out there and they were back in 1975, 85. Uh, we used to have to have cameras on the eagle nests and not disturb them when we were picking the fruit. We weren't allowed to use any production chemicals. So they've been in the hunt of, a, of true, you know, very staunch environmental conservative, conservatism mm -hmm. of that cape and that grounds around it. They were, they were tough on us, yet they, it grew really fabulous citrus because it's on that coquina rock out there. So uh, we hated to see it go, but greening took the, those groves away about 20 years ago, but they were great partners. And unfortunately, Greeny took it away because we couldn't defend it because they didn't allow any, any mm -hmm. chemicals. But what a great place to grow citrus. And, and they are, they've been great partners and they're very environmentally aware out there. They really are. Great. Okay. If everybody Thanks. agrees, we can request NASA do a presentation at our, um, one of our next meetings. Yeah, February meeting. We'll extend an invitation and uh, get that scheduled. Wonderful. Okay. All right, our next um, advisory committee is the STEM Advisory Committee presented by Dr. Chuck Jacoby. Good, greetings again. Um, we did not meet a quorum, so we went through the issues um, and talked about them. Uh, but generally speaking, um, there were overall approvals for the communications plan, the financing plan, the workforce analysis, the transition policy, and we even agreed to the meeting calendar. 
I'm happy Great. to take any questions. Any questions? All right. I have a Go ahead, Jen. What can we do to ensure a quorum in the future? Is there anything we can do as board members or uh, directing? You know, it's a strange time, let's face it. Every day is stranger. Yes. But um, I, I just wondered if, again, I think it's important to talk about things. I don't drive all the way up here just to, to nod my head. I yes. drive up here to have a conversation and make sure that we are helping and doing the best that, that we can do. And that was a topic of discussion, probably one of the major ones, um, which was, you know, how do we how do we move this forward? And so we'll be looking at several different avenues. Um, you know, who who is representing different entities? Um, you know, I mean, some some people may have more interest than others. Um, perhaps there's a way we can do something hybrid, you know, which would help people. Um, people got used yeah. to used to that concept. Um, that's a little awkward with sunshine and all, but you know we, we may be able to find a way around that. So yeah, we'll be looking at, at multiple ways to try and and draw this in. Um, cer certainly from my standpoint as the chair, you know, I mean that's something I would like to see happen. So you know we ne we need to find an involved group that's going to be willing to stay involved. So. Um, but you point out, you know, it has been a very strange time. That's great. So. Well, I'm, I'm here to support whatever you need. Great. Thank you, Chuck. Okay, our next advisory committee is Citizens Advisory Committee presented by Captain Frank Catino. Or, or Kathy. Or me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so CAC met last Thursday. Not last Thursday, the Thursday before that. On the uh, 18th. Um, they also did not meet a quorum, so they only had a few members there. Um, but a couple of things of note, um, so they reviewed the marketing RFP that is now out uh, for education, um, and what that RFP is gonna be doing is soliciting um, proposals from professional marketers to do some market research and test messaging about what would work to move people to some action that would help the lagoon. So we're gonna try that and uh, see how that goes. And hopefully that will help us with some of the videos that we're doing. We have some messaging in those videos that we wanna test and make sure that it's the right, taking the right approach. So they reviewed that and um, again, they didn't have a quorum so they didn't approve it, but they, they, the consensus was that it was moving in the right direction. Um, they looked at the workforce analysis as well and the consensus was to uh, let you know that they are recommending that for approval. And they also looked at the meeting calendar. They adjusted the May meeting um, by one week uh, there. And uh, the slide that you're gonna see later does not have that change, but there is a change just to the CAC meeting in that, in that uh, May meeting. And that's it. Great. Dwayne, did in the past, haven't we had a, um, a little report where it shows our our committee appointees um, participation or attendance, and yeah. maybe that would be something that the board members would be interested to um, therefore then reach out to their appointees and you know just just have a dialogue and a conversation about participation. We'll have that for you uh, at the February meeting, uh, but we're looking at uh, two or three different options and of course we couldn't explore them officially because we didn't have a quorum in those committees because we really want them to own their <clears throat> committees and so we have pretty high thresholds for quorum we could lower that threshold you know after six years we're you know seeing some folks showing a little wear and tear and especially in the stem ac where we have one representative per organization you know, maybe it's time for those organizations to have another volunteer step in. Um, and, and so we'll bring solutions to you all to the quorum issue. Uh, and a lot of it, I, I think Jackie mentioned, this was an odd year and our academic partners are feeling it probably as much as anybody. You know, it's right at the end of the semester after a difficult year, you know, most of them are on Zoom you know, with their classes. And so we're just feeling a little bit of that, you know, six years in, you know, maybe it's time to, you know, change some folks around if they want. 
and, and, and maybe there's op options. One that they talked about uh, in the STEM AC was actually having an official alternate. So you would actually, you know, appoint the scientists representing that organization, but we'd have an official alternate if something came up. We'll bring solutions uh, because we really do think it's valuable to have them in a space, face to face, having these discussions. And uh, we have looked at this, the hybrid situation is really difficult for us. You know, I'd love to see a state legislator relook at Sunshine as it relates to advisory committees. Uh, because, you know, as you all know, this is a long drive. If you're down in Martin County or Volusia, you know, it's a, it's a long trek to come to a meeting. It's a, a half a day to a full day, depending on where you're coming from. Uh, but if we offer Zoom as a hybrid, we're really worried we're not going to have a quorum, you know, to actually do the voting, because technically, you know, it would be illegal to have those individuals vote uh, via Zoom. So we're in a tough situation with hybrid meetings. You know, if I had the option, drive or don't drive, I'd be taking the Zoom and then we'd have these quorum problems even worse than we do now. So we'll investigate options um, and come to you with a, a way to invigorate the, the participation. Great, thank you so much. Anybody else on the um, committee reports? Okay, with that, we're moving on to our consent agenda. Uh, today, we are gonna be approving our August 13th uh, meeting minutes. And we have some management conference appointments. And Dwayne, you're going to have to help me with the um, pronunciation again. Of Jake Foytek. Foytek. Good guy. All right, so we have uh, uh, Jake Foytek from the Florida Farm Bureau Foundation, and Jake will be replacing Gary Ritter. So I want to thank Gary Ritter. Now, he is still going to be participating, but he took a, another job with the city of Okeechobee and has been a true asset on the committee. So, um, Well, he's look, coming back. He's coming back. So on the next appointment, he is going to um, represent the city of Okeechobee, um, as the current city administrator to the management board. And then our third uh, appointment is Ms. Julie Mitchell from the Fish and Wildlife Biologist uh, FWC to, to represent um, FWC. And we have Matt Jones, the interim utilities director for Indian River County to represent Indian River County. And with that, I would um, ask for a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. Thank you. We have a motion by Commissioner Adams. Second. Seconded by Commissioner Smith. Mm -hmm. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much. Okay, and this morning we're going to have a presentation um, uh, on the importance of high confidence data to geospatial analysis for the environmental management of our Indian River Lagoon. And I'm going to have uh, Dr. DeFries uh, introduce our presenter. Thank you. I'm really excited to uh, introduce our next presenter. Kirsten Jo Ayers, KJ, is a member of our team and she was hired as part of the DEP innovation grant with GeoCollaborate looking at harmful algal blooms. And she comes to us with a, a really deep knowledge and actually love of GIS and data analysis. And so KJ is on the point of the spear right now, working with both water management districts, Chuck Jacoby's team, and now also Dennis Hanasak at Harbor Branch to actually go through conditional data sets going back decades and turning those data sets into QAQC trusted data. So I wanted to, number one, have her come here to see you face to face as a member of our team. She works remotely. She actually lives in Texas. Uh, let you know that we're really lucky to have her. And, and she really does. It's, it's odd working like this, but she is a member of our team and we, we talk weekly. Uh, and she's gonna showcase 
you know, the challenges of taking data to decision making. And then in, on December 6th, we'll do the first workshop, and she'll mention this again, I think, uh, for the GeoCollaborate grant, and, and that will be a series of three more in January. So if you miss the December, we're going to have a few more. Uh, but she's going to give you an idea about the workload of data in order to get it to that trusted point to make a decision. So KJ, it's all yours. So hi, everybody. Can you hear me OK? Morning, yes. Cool. Um, so my name is KJ. Um, like Dwayne mentioned, I'm originally from South Pot well, I'm originally from Jacksonville Beach, and then I lived in Volusia County for a bit, and then I worked for the city of Palm Coast and Flagler County, and then I moved to Texas because I went to UT and got my master's there. So um, I'm going to be talking about kind of like the importance of high confidence data and geospatial analysis, specifically here in the IRL. So just to kind of give a little bit of a background, um, I'm going to be explaining kind of a traditional spatial or a GIS approach when you're looking at water quality data. Um, the goal of this project, I'm, I think uh, Dave and Ellen came before and explained what the GeoCollaborate project was, but just to kind of reiterate it, we're going to be creating a virtual harmful algal bloom information center specifically for here in the IRL. Um, there's going to be a, a bunch of different parts of it. Um, we're going to be doing a hindcast series, an emergency response series, and then also expanding to other areas of Florida, just kind of looking at creating this information center. Um, so I got hired back in May, and so far my, jo uh, my job has been kind of finding and reaching out to data collectors from the state levels, from the county levels, um, what was it, the different water management districts, and then also FAU and FIT. Um, and then also looking at QA processes or quality assurance processes and uh, applying quality control to those data sets. Um, I've also been displaying these data sets into like a geospatial formats. We're creating kind of a a housing, like a GIS hub for data, specifically for here in the IRL, pointing users to locations of where data is actually being stored. Um, I've also created a QAQC manual with the help of my team, um, just to look at future data set integration into this project. So I feel like I threw QAQC at you guys. Um, QAQC is just quality assurance and quality control. Uh, the U.S. Geological Survey um, defines QAQC as QA is anything done prior or during sample collection, so when you're going out in the field taking your samples or if you're doing continuous real-time monitoring, and QC is any methodology applied after, so any corrections, calibrations, that sort of thing, um, so at defect detection. So. Um, there's a lot of data out there, but in order to use any of that lab or field data collections, it needs to be trustable. But how do you get to that trustability point? So this is a map of all the data sites that are being collected across the IRL, all the way from Volusia to Mount Martin County. Um, so this is part of the One Lagoon Monitoring Project, which is another project that the IRL NEP is working on. Um, as you can see, there's approximately 70 monitoring programs across the IRL. All those little dots are anywhere from benthic stations, harmful algal bloom monitoring stations, seagrass monitoring stations, atmospheric depositions, discrete or continuous water quality stations. There's a lot of data being collected out in the IRL. So um, you saw that map. There's a bunch of little dots on a map. Where do we start when we're looking at all that data? Um, the algal blooms are very complicated, so you need to look at light availability, precipitation, runoff, nutrient availability, residence time, among many other variables. So, and also, <coughs> it, can, it varies on species types. So whether you're looking at brown tide up in the, the northern IRL or you're looking at a cyanobacteria bloom down in the southern IRL, um, it just kind of depends. So we decided as a team the best at course of action was to look at the St. John's River Water Management District and the South Florida Water Management Districts, kind of combining their data sets together so we got a good spatial range of the whole IRL. So. We started looking at water quality parameters. These were the seven we decided to go with initially. Chlorophyll A, which can kind of be a proxy for algal blooms. Dissolved oxygen, low DO leads to fish kills. Temperature, higher temps drive lower DOs. Salinity, pH, nutrients, and turbidity. So you can see there's little asteroids next to nutrients and turbidities. They are very complicated and really hard to model. So um, we are still in the process of looking at those, but I've finished um, one through five already. So these are all the sampling, discrete sampling points between both the water management districts, South Florida and St. John's. Um, 
As you can see, there are some gaps. Is it going to let me point? Yes, it is. Awesome. So there is a huge gap up here in Cape Canaveral, um, up here in the northern Banana River in the lower Mosquito Lagoon. You can see there's not that many stations up there, which is why I'm super excited about FAU and NASA partnering and creating a new station up there. Um, but from these points, you can kind of see there's some spatial gaps. And it's really hard to point out areas of interest or hot spots of algal blooms just based on these dots alone. So we decided as a team to run an interpolation, which basically just, I'm going to explain what interpolation is. Basically, all those points on the map, um, they have a value correlated with whether it be pH, temperature, um, and they're basically doing a, uh, excuse me, I'm getting a little nervous, um, linear um, algebra between the two to basically predict what the values are between the points you can't sample. So this is an example of a DEM, which is a digital elevation map, which is something similar to what we did. So as you can see, those little orange dots at the top, those are actual sampling points of elevation. And if you look over to the right, this map, it basically takes those elevations to predict what the values are between those points. So this is a very slow gift, um, but it's going to iterate through January of 2016 to um, there it goes, through May of 2016. So this is what the first hindcast of what we're looking at, which is the 2016 fish kill and the harmful algal bloom. So this model, um, so all those different points are the sampling points. Um, I'm going to be able to publish it online so you guys can see it as well. Um, but basically those points and the colors of those points correspond with the values of where those sampling points are. This is specifically chlorophyll A. So as you see, the cooler tones show kind of lower um, chlorophyll A values, while the warmer tones show higher chlorophyll A values. So this doesn't look, as you can see behind it, the polygon, that's the interpolation. Um, we ran about 40 different models to choose which one had the least standard error and gave the most accurate results. So it was a lot of statistics and a lot of work, but thank you to Chuck and to Rex at the St. John's River Waters Management District for helping me along the way. Um, after we did that, um, I created a script that basically went all the way back from January of 2007 all the way to January of 2021 to show that change over time, to look for hot spots for chlorophyll A, pH, salinity, temperature, just so we can see what was going on between that time period. The reason I'm only showing you this is because on December 6th, we're specifically talking about the 2016 fish kill, because that after the 2011 super bloom, people started getting interested and more collectors were available. So, kind of the timeline um, of what I've done so far, um, that only included two data sets, so the two discrete data sets. It took me about two to three months to go through and quality control it, make sure that there were no outliers, make sure the data actually made sense, and that it had the least standard error. Moving forward, we want to integrate more data into this project so we can get more partners involved. Uh, this is going to require a lot more time and a lot more QC efforts because people's data isn't always on the same level of QA, QC. So algal blooms are super complicated and there's very, and a lot of variables that play into it, but imagine how powerful it would be if we had one easy to use interface that had all those data sets working together. So that's the goal of kind of this project. So this is kind of the challenges and the lessons that I've learned. <laughs> Um, organizations are very hesitant and take time to release data, um, whether it be academia wanting to publish papers, whether the water management districts wanting to make sure that their data is ac accurate. Um, they just have different release, um, release efforts. There's if different instrumentation and different calibrations. So to measure the same variable, you could be using something completely different. Um, and so that can kind of play a problem in like sampling collections. Sampling frequencies, um, some people only go out once a month. Some people are uh, continually water quality every 15 minutes, 15 seconds. It just depends on you know, the money, the space, the time, where you are. Um, I only mentioned kind of the horizontal limitations, so like the distance, the spatial distance, but there's also vertical um, spa spatial limitations as well. So we're not, all that stuff that I was showing you before on that map is just the surface. It's not benthic, it's not below the water column. So we really don't know what was going on below there. Also, equipment maintenance, people have different schedules for equipment maintenance, um, and consistent QA data guidelines. You could go for the, if you're on an EPA grant, an FDEP grant, there's different, uh, there's different procedures and QA, QC guidelines. And also, detection limits are a big problem. So when you're looking at those nutrients, sometimes the values are way below the detection limits, so you, you don't have an accurate value of what's actually in the water column. So, 
Moving forward, um, I'm looking at real-time data from St. John's River Water Management District and from Harbor Branch. I'm working with um, Dennis Hanasak, kind of going through his data, starting the QAQC process for all his data, because that's really valuable data that we could potentially use for uh, data prediction and data-driven decision-making. Um, I'm also pulling in the FWC fish kill boundary. I've already been talking about the, with the fisheries and the public health at FWC, kind of looking at what data they have out there as well as looking at profile data, so that vertical water column that I was talking about from F FIT, so we can kind of do like a comparative between surface and benthic levels. And then I also want to reach out to more organizations to integrate more data pertaining to HABs, because having more collaborations is going to be very helpful when we're looking at um, these events. So <laughs> takeaways, this is what I've learned from the my few months here. Um, there are many organizations collecting data, but to use it operationally, you need to go through a QAQC process. Um, it takes a lot of time and work to quality control data sets, especially that the ones that don't have anything in place originally. And then we've already started to identify some of the limitations and challenges of combining data sets together. Cool. Questions? <laughs> Doug, yes. Yeah, hi. Uh a few years ago, I looked in to see who had aerial photography of the, of the lagoon to look at canopies of the, of the uh, mangroves just for their health, thinking that we, if we could detect it, this is maybe 15 years ago, if we could detect the, the health of mang uh, mangroves going downhill, we could do something about it. I found there were 12 major agencies back then doing aerial work, but they weren't working together. To, so for, to your point, I think this is great to try to bring it together because there's a lot of standalone information. And these, they don't even, when I started to call, uh, the Kennedy Space Center did a lot, versus our industry does a lot of aerial work because of our citrus industry. We wanted uh, aerial photography of our groves. We had aerials of the Inuver Lagoon that go way back. And so we could do something about that. But, but I, they all weren't talking. And so this is great. You're going to bring this all together. I think you're going to have a treasure trove of info. That's the goal, um, yeah. to have kind of like a platform where if you're wanting to do research, if you're wanting to reach out to people who are collecting data, just so you can have their contact information and work collaboratively, that would be the end-all, be-all goal. No question. Yeah. Good ha work. Has this been presented to the Harmful Algae Bloom Task Force uh, that, you know, that you're aware of? Not yet. We're going to invite uh, both the HAB Task Force and the Cyanobacterial Task Force to you know, to these, we, we're calling them instances. We, we have three instances which are, you know, moments of looking. So the first one will be a hindcast, uh, and the very first session will be December 6th, but we'll do three more in January. Then the second instance is going to be almost an emergency response scenario, looking very specifically at 2016, from the standpoint of how do you mobilize the right entities, you know, when you're in an emergency situation like a fish kill, which we all lived through uh, back in, in 16, and you know, were making decisions on the fly. Could we get an emergency response capability with this geo collaborate? And then the last one, which is going to be really challenging, which will be later in 2022, we'll be looking at data from uh, Lake Okeechobee, some of the cyanobacterial data, and then some of the harmful algal bloom data on the Gulf of Mexico to see if this GeoCollaborate software uh, can be an effective platform statewide to have that conversation. So we are going to reach out to both task forces, all the agencies, and you know this first one we're keeping kind of within our hundred volunteers with a few outreaches and then for example we'll specifically target DEP key water management district folks uh, as we get into the other three sessions for this first instance so our hope is that we're going to touch a lot of people you know over this next year and at the very least if everybody who's collecting data you know, begins to look at QAQC. We're not going to do it the same. There's, I don't imagine we're ever going to have everybody in 100% agreement on the front end of what the QAQC and methodologies are. But if everybody would just 
ramp up while they're collecting data in that quality assurance, quality control, then that data can come into this kind of platform as trusted data, and then we can use it to make decisions. Um, and one thing you all hear, you know, there, and Chuck and I, and we've all talked about this a lot, everybody loves real-time data. And the power of real-time data, like the Lobo <clears throat> at Harbor Branch and the Kilroys at Orca, super powerful, but you have to understand that if it's real-time, this level of QA, QC is impossible. And so you have to take care when you're using real-time data to make sure you don't over-push decisions on data that may have variability because you, you know, you're using it as it's happening. And so we're going to take a look at that as well. Great. Jackie. Very good presentation. Thank you. Every time I come up here, I'm a little bit out of my element because I'm, I'm very hyper-focused uh, in the southern part of the system with the St. Lucie River, Indian River Lagoon, and, and Lake Okeechobee. Can, can you tell me about the BMAP programs along the Indian River Lagoon up here through the Florida Department of Environmental Protection and how this could maybe tie into that too? You're looking at me, so yes. I'm going to jump in. <laughs> so, you know, the BMAPs are all based on modeling, and that modeling was based on data on nutrient loads. And, and responses. And, and so where this can be very useful is if we have more data points from more disparate sources, we can increase the, the robust nature of that modeling um, if we have QAQC data. And so, you know, you, you saw the map. I mean, very often you hear nobody's doing any water quality the fact is we have a lot of people doing water quality, but are those data QAQC'd enough for DEP to actually use them in a, a modeling scenario for a BMAP? So the hope would be that we're expanding the available data for those modeling exercises as BMAPs. Every five years they get re-looked at and recalibrated based on new information. Right. So how many BMAPs are there in, along the Indian River Lagoon? So we have four. So we have Banana River, uh, Northern Indian River Lagoon, Central Indian River Lagoon, and in the Southern Indian River Lagoon, we don't have a BMAP proper for the Southern IRL, but we have a BMAP for the St. Lucie River and Estuary. Mm -hmm. And in addition to that, just recently, the last couple of years, Volusia County uh, did a reasonable assurance plan, which is very similar to a BMAP, except it's in advance of the regulation. And so that we have a wrap for Mosquito Lagoon. So we are pretty well covered in BMAPs and reasonable assurance plans, and those are going through, you know, the process of projects, nutrient reduction, based on the models that those plans were, you know, delivered with. And then, uh, Aaron, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think every five years when we look at progress, there's also a discussion at DEP about appropriate modeling and, and new data uh, acquisition. Is that correct? Yes. Um, excellent. One of the things we're, we're running into with the South Florida Water Management District and in and, and a place where I think we're making a lot of progress lately is um, something that we call the triangle. And uh, it's basically because it's not the same as here because it's different here, but it's, the, um, it's in Florida statutes and it's the, the NEEP, which is the Northern Estuaries uh, Program. And within that program, it says right there in Florida statutes that the Florida Department of Environmental Protection, okay, it's right there in their title, Florida Department of Environmental Protection, the South Florida Water Management District, and FDAX, uh, you know, the Agriculture uh, Water Quality Community, 
are responsible for improving water quality in uh, the NEEP, which would be the St. Lucie River, Indian River Lagoon, the Caloosahatchee, and the uh, Lake Okeechobee. And so what's been really great about pressing with this, and there's a long story, a lot more with it, but some, I think it was Doug who was talking earlier about people talking to each other, that you often have all of these agencies and taxpayer money being spent and all of this energy, but people aren't uh, talking to each other. And so with the triangle, the whole, it's taken a year, but we've got the South Florida Water Management District talking to FDEP, talking to FDACs, because there have been issues. They can be political, they can be cultural, but sometimes these agencies are not talking to each other. And the bottom line for the state of Florida is, you know, it's FDEP, it's the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. <laughs> that's what they're supposed, that's the title. And so um, I think it's great, but I, you know, I hope that we can tie this into FDEP for sure. You know, they should hopefully, they should be part of this. They should be using this. The B maps should be part of this. You know, information for information's sake isn't as useful as information that can be collaborated on. And I know your, your um, goal is to collaborate, but you know, for us too, with the South Florida Water Management District, we have found a lot of strength in calling the agencies what's in the law. You know, it's like the gentleman came up here and spoke earlier. I mean, we have, we have to start, we are in a crisis point. We are in a crisis point for our wildlife. We are in a crisis point for a lot of our waters. And this is awesome, all the stuff that you're doing here, but I mean, maybe we can help you, I can help you tie this into the state agencies. They should be a, jumping up and down for this. It's, it's ammunition for them to do the things that they are required to do by state law, which is to make sure our, our water quality is good. And Governor DeSantis has been super supportive on all this stuff protecting Florida together. You may have seen that. That was a, a website that they um, got up and running basically for what you're doing here. It, it, was, um, it was not in real time. And when things are not in real time in this world, they don't count basically because people wanna see things in real time. I mean, what you're doing is super important, super valuable. I just hope that we are not afraid to uh, create another triangle here or another what, baton, whatever it is, to make sure that um, we're working with the, the state agencies that have the responsibility to clean up our waters, number one, and, and have the authority to do that. But very exciting what you're doing. Thank you so much. That's great. Can I add one thing? KJ, yes. Um, so FDEP is funding this whole project. They're actively involved in it. They've been reviewing my QAQC manual. I've been talking to people on a regular, so is Dan. So they're actively involved well, in sorry, it. Well, I'm sorry, I didn't know that. They're funding the whole project? Yes. As yeah, part of the innovative grant technology grant, grant. Uh, mechanism. Well, that's fantastic. So tell us about the kind of support you've gotten, the kind of conversations you've had with the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. Um, mostly it's been them reviewing like our standards for how we're going, we're approaching data sets and quality control and qu uh, quality assurance and quality control. So we've gotten, what was it? We just got back our QAQC manual and I think we had six or seven people from their QAQC department and their modeling department kind of give us critiques on what we can do and moving forward, kind of help us thinking, thinking about filling in those gaps of initial problems we never thought about. So that's mostly been our communication for now because F FAU, um, St. John's River Water Management District and FDEP are like the main collaborators with this project. So, did I answer that okay? Well, that's great. And they're funding it? Yes. FDEP is funding it 100%. Yes, How much have they given you? It's uh, $963,000. Wow. And I think it's worth uh, pointing out that this particular project was focused on harmful algal blooms but that GeoCollaborate software isn't limited. So this is the first time that software has ever been applied to harmful algal blooms anywhere in the nation. And, but we could apply it to projects. So you know, every project on the lagoon could be integrated, that data set, into a GeoCollaborate communication platform. 
And, and to your point, you know, when we're looking at a BMAP, if we've got multiple data sets, that GeoCollaborate software could be used literally to be online. So if each of you had data that we wanted to share and then have a conversation on Zoom call, where instead of having individual screens, so, you know, we open Aaron's screen, see what DEP has, open South Florida's screen, see what South Florida, this software integrates it all on a single screen where you can kind of zoom in and out. You can look at, you know, uh, we're doing time series so that GeoCollaborate can't do a time series yet, but that time series you saw is being done, you know, with traditional GIS. So it's taking kind of data, you know, to a trusted place and then being able to communicate it amongst as many, we could have a thousand people online, you know, with a hundred different data sets and, and have a conversation about what next. You well, know, what is, are we that seeing? That is it's great. Pretty powerful. And I'm sorry I have not done my homework, obviously, but um, it's confusing to me that you're presenting this, but it's 100% uh, supported by, by DEP, and I think that's fantastic. And, and I just, I do, I do hope that it's tied together with the BMAPs, you know, and that we, even though that's not what we're really doing here, I mean, that's the only mechanism we have right now to clean our waters. Yeah, so the GeoCollaborate, as long as it's available, readily available, it can be in a JPEG, it can be in a CSV, whatever for it, KMML, we can integrate it and we can show it on the platform. Um, I don't know what sort of analysis we'll do with it yet, um, but right. we can def definitely show it and bring it into it, the instance. So, right. Well, that is, excuse me for my mistake, and that is super exciting, and uh, I hope it's uh, collaborated with the BMAP program and uh, any agency that uh, has the responsibility to keep our waters clean. Thank you. Cool. That was a great presentation, KJ. Okay, we're moving on to old business and we're going to um, have Dr. DeFries present to review and adopt the Regional Restoration Center MOA and IRL Council Resolution. Uh, welcome. Well, we were just speaking about communication and collaboration and this is exactly what we're doing here. Uh, so back in 2009, when we passed our CCMP, we recognized four existing regional restoration centers uh, because there was physical facilities, you know, tourism opportunities, education opportunities, research. Um, and you remember, uh, we had Marine Discovery Center up in New Smyrna Beach, Brevard Zoo in Brevard County, Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institution, down in Fort Pierce and Florida Oceanographic Society. This is that next step. And so you have two documents before you. One is a memorandum of agreement, which the executive directors of the four institutions have agreed to sign, and I have that signed already. And then a resolution of support from this board, uh, recognizing this, you know, let's call it a, a string of pearls. These are the regional and local centers where we have large capacity capability. And uh, we'll talk about it in my report, but we have been moving to this point of, of understanding that if we don't build restoration capacity, we won't get there. And you can't do it little project by little project. You need to build a hard infrastructure to do the work. This is the beginning of that hard infrastructure. And I think it's important for anybody who's watching, this does not preclude other partners, Marine Resources Council, Florida Institute of Technology, University of Florida, other folks that are doing restoration, but these are gonna be physical anchors within the local you know, communities that we'll, we will recognize as the place to start building uh, habitat re and species restoration capacity. And they're already doing it now. So these are the heavy delivery points uh, for both education, outreach, and, and habitat restoration. So with that, I'm open for questions. Okay. Anybody have any questions? 
So what we all need is a motion to approve the MOA so and moved. include um, a resolution from us supporting the MOA. So Okay. Second. Great. We have a uh, motion by Doug, seconded by Aaron. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. And in new business, we have the fiscal year 2021 budget amendment um, presented by Dan Kalani. Good morning. Good morning. So per Florida statutes, we have uh, up until 60 days to make any amendments to the prior fiscal year budget. And so we did have uh, one, a couple of changes that we'd like to make to the budget from last fiscal year. Uh, so this first resolution, the changes are mostly in uh, the DEP revenue. So we're reducing it down to what we spend it so far in it. And then you're going to see the balance is going to go forward into the next <coughs> resolution into fiscal year 2022. Uh, in turn, that also reduces our other expenditures by that same amount. So it was $612,000. Uh, we also had to make one adjustment to salaries and benefits. And this is due to uh, increases in fringe from FRS and um, medical insurance as well as a reconciliation for our two prior administrative coordinators. When they left, they got their PTO paid out and it kind of pushed us a little up. So we're taking that uh, 32,500 out of contingency reserve to cover that cost. And that's the only changes to the budget that we're making for last year. Does anybody have any questions on the budget? With that, they will look for a motion to um, adopt the amended budget. So moved. Thank you. Commissioner Adams? I'll Can second it, please. Okay. So we have a motion by Commissioner Adams, seconded by Jackie Thurlow Lippish. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much. And. Okay, our, our next item is going to be, I see Dan still standing up there, but I have the next item as approval of the communication plan. So did I miss something? Should be the uh, next budget amendment. Okay, so I did. Okay, so we have our fiscal 2022 budget, uh, fiscal year 2022 budget amendment also yep. presented by Dan. So this budget amendment for this Thanks. current fiscal year is just bringing that uh, balance from the DEP grant forward in that we just saw in the previous budget amendment. So we're bringing that $612,000 in as, uh, as revenue as well as expenditures to match it since it's a reimbursement type of grant. Okay. And so those should be the only changes that you see made to this budget. Everything else stays in force. Okay, so I'll look for a motion to amend and adopt the fiscal year 2022. So moved. Okay. We have a motion by Commissioner Adams, seconded by Aaron. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Unless you want to stay up there and do one more. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, we have our next item is the approval of the communication plan presented by Kathy. Great. So I'm, I'm not going to belabor this. You have the document, and hopefully you've had a chance to at least scan it. I uh, just want to give you some highlights for it. So the communication plan is an EPA concurrence document. That means they have to agree to it as well. Um, and so we wrote this sort of as a very general kind of plan. Um, it doesn't go into any heavy detail. It's just kind of, you know, on the, a high level overview of what we're going to be planning for communications. Um, Basically, it's built around internal communications, kind of improving our internal communications, engaging our committees more than what we're doing currently, um, engaging community leaders somewhat more, um, and then doing some work with targeted audiences. So much of what you've seen in our videos have gone to particular target audiences. We're going to keep that up and see if we can start moving that ball a little more um, with getting people to do and, and to behave in lagoon-friendly ways. Um, we're going to continue our social media plan, and we have instituted a social media policy with that. And then um, it just kind of outlines what we're going to do for special projects, particularly Envirothon, but also um, some of the work with Civic, which is a social 
uh, environmental justice kind of um, project. Let's see. Um, we're going to increase the way that we communicate progress and also help our partners to communicate their project uh, progress as well for projects. Uh, so that's going to be a big part of the upcoming social media strategy and how we how we go through. So as, so as soon as we hear that somebody has completed a project, maybe it's Brevard County or Martin County, um, Martin County particularly and Brevard have been super great about doing videos for when their projects end. And so we, we share those freely, um, we highlight them, and we're going to continue doing that, but do it more than what we do right now. Uh, and then lastly, a focus on web collaterals, uh, print and web collaterals, that we are intending to develop with partners a suite of pamphlets, brochures, um, continuing the videos that everybody can use. So we have all of our videos posted on our YouTube channel right now. Uh, we are intending to do the same thing for print and web collaterals where it'll be branded to the NEP, to the One Lagoon, but there'll be room for co-branding. So if Martin County wanted to pick up a trash-free lagoon brochure and print it and send it to their folks, they can put their logos on it and, you know, add their own taglines and things like that. So basically that's it in a nutshell. But if you have any questions, I'd be happy to fill in the gaps. I just think this is so important because those of us that have lived here in a long time, we understand the um, challenges facing us, but you think of all the new residents we have moving to Florida mm -hmm. that don't understand the dynamics that are impacting our water quality and waterways, and this is imperative to the education of those new residents. So I think it's, it's wonderful. Uh, I've got a question. Yes, Doug, go ahead. Yeah, do you have a media day for, for the newspapers <clears throat> where you take them out on a tour or invite them to to see anything that is current in like like for example in the in Jackie's backyard you'd have TC Palm and the Stewart News out for a day where there's a significant thing going on that you want to highlight uh, that impacts the lagoon or up here it'd be it would be the uh, TC Palm again up here and, and the, the Today paper in Melbourne. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, would, do you highlight focusing on them to s kind of encourage them to put more pro information out, any more positive information about the lagoon? We, we can certainly do that. We have not done that to this point because we're, we're kind of just running in place right now with what we're doing. So I, we're I completely <laughs> understand. Yeah. But, le but there, you know, you it would hurt to reach out and say um, and hand them like we do with when, when, when I lobby and I go to Washington and I hand a, a U.S. senator a, a one-pager. Mm -hmm. That's key because yep. there's two pages don't get read in Washington. The first page is it. Yeah. And to hand them a page of, of, of the lagoon and what they can convey to people that live in Vero or Melbourne or, or Volusia County, mm -hmm. this is what you can do. You, if you're reading this, you're, you live in the Indian River Lagoon Basin. Right. And we encourage you to A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Not too many, not, not, not page two. Right. But a one pager that you can hand to the press saying, this is our goal, this, this helps, uh, you know, get off septic, blah, 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 the major features that we know are, are poisoning the lagoon. Uh, I think, you know, we do it in my industry, and we find it very, very resourceful. They do, too, because mm -hmm. um, everybody likes to throw rocks until they, they see it, they smell it, they feel it. Right. And the newspapers are great at that, throwing rocks, <laughs> I know. Uh, so uh, I think there might be some value, and you, you've got a great staff to, you know, all, all, any of you would be wonderful to talk to the press and uh, give them a, a, a go-away tear sheet. You know, that's a, that's a great idea. And we've actually been talking to some of our partners. Some of the smaller uh, nonprofits have that idea. Um, there's one particularly in Brevard that is interested in going down right to the neighborhood level, where they're right. going to go knock on doors and give right. people a sheet that right. says, here's what's going on in your neighborhood. Right. I, I don't think we're going to get that micro with it. but. We're, we're actually talking about helping them and how we, you know, ways that we can help them. The hardest part is it, it, 
20 years ago, a newspaper, any of them, had, a, had an agricultural person, they had an environmental person, they had a business person. Now they have a, a person that writes all of it. Mm -hmm. So they don't, don't really know all the issues as well as they used to because they're, they're so broadly spaced. Sure. But uh, I, I really think handing them uh, our goals, our needs, and what we want to convey to Joe Public living in Sebastian or mm -hmm. Bureau or Stewart. Uh, so I, I, we found it really helpful in, in my line of work. So. Yeah, we, we will incorporate that for sure. Okay. Jackie? I just want to uh, stand with Doug. I think that's a great idea. I know your time is limited. But that uh, Florida Today newspapers, of course, are in Melbourne. That's mm -hmm. their headquarters. And they have seven newspapers in the state. And then there might be other newspapers that, you know, you don't want to just go with that newspaper. But that makes it easy yeah. when they have so many connections to newspapers and, and their hub is right here mm -hmm. and has been for so many years. So, you know, I think uh, we would be ha happy to, to make that connection, too, if... Uh, Great. There's no time for, for staff. Fantastic. And what you're doing is great. I love the videos. Uh, I watch the videos, and I feel very guilty if I wash my car in my driveway now. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. <laughs> Jeff. I, I just wanted to encourage you as, as well. I think we heard from the, the speaker in the back of the room, from the public, you could hear the urgency mm -hmm. in his voice. You mentioned crisis. Um, the perception from the public is that we don't recognize a crisis and right. that agencies don't recognize a crisis. So communication is really key. While we want to be careful not to um, disperse fear to the mm -hmm. public, we need to let them know that there are things that can be done. There are many things that we are doing. Um, I, I think that so, so communication is just really critical. I think we're going to have to, as a state, to look at the way that we develop and where we develop through the lens of water. You know, mm -hmm. the, where's it going to come from? From this morning, we all read in the paper that Florida has the lowest rate of new infections of COVID in the country. And my wife and my kids were all excited, and I'm thinking another 900 people a day are going to come <laughs> from the north to our to a safe state. <clears throat> um, where's the water going to come from and what's the quality going to be? So right. communication of what each of us can do to, um, to, to improve water quality and conserve water, I think is critical. So. Yeah, and, and that really is going to be our focus is to make projects visible. So people drive down the road every day, they see projects going in, they have no idea what they are, what they're doing, why they're even doing them. And we think we can help with that. And just to make those things visible. I'm in the process now of producing our um, annual report. And we ask our partners every year, what are you doing? What are you doing that's outside our money um, for projects that help the lagoon? There's something like 270 projects that are going on in five counties. And no one knows about them, you know? So we, we can help with that. Great. And with that, we're looking for a motion to adopt the communication plan, and that's contingent on the EPA's con concurrence. So moved. Thank you. Commissioner Adams? Need a second. second. Commissioner Brower, thank you, with a second. And all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank, thank you very you. much. Our next item this morning is the approval of the financing of the CCMP plan presented by Dr. DeFries. Uh, this also is a uh, one of those CCMP concurrence documents. Uh, just to give you a heads up on what's coming, we have four of these that we have to do uh, post-CCMP. Uh, the two that are in the works right now is a one lagoon monitoring plan that'll be actually a very nice, you know, second piece to what we're doing with DEP on the Geo Collaborate. And then also a One Lagoon Habitat Restoration Plan that's actually sitting on my desk going through scientific review right now. It's gonna look at all of the primary habitats and try to bring it into a, a big picture for guidance on habitat restoration. 
So this financing the CCMP plan historically and traditionally is, is just a general document. And we took it to the next level uh, because we felt that because of the urgency and the fact that we had taken that step to get now over a thousand projects on a project list, that we needed a number. People want to know how much, and it's really hard to project costs. You know, you look at Everglades restoration over the last three decades and how the incremental costs have gone up over time. Uh, but we felt really compelled to, to do this as a full technical document. So you'll see two pieces of this. The first document itself, let me make sure I don't, is the plan itself. And that is a lengthy uh, piece of work. It has an appendix, so it's in two pieces. The plan itself, the body of the plan, identifies approximately $5 billion worth of need. And much of that is in infrastructure, uh, whether it's wastewater treatment, septic to sewer, large and small stormwater, muck dredging. And we use different lines of evidence to come to that number. And we also talk a lot about, I think, the more important issue. So we talk about cost a lot and rarely talk about benefit. We know the economic value based on 2016 estimates is about $7.6 billion a year. And so when you first hear $5 billion, the first reaction is, oh, we'll never be able to afford that. But when you think about $7.6 billion in asset value a year, you, know, you can start to look at this from a benefit-cost ratio. And so the plan itself goes through kind of that thought process you know, about projects, costs, benefits. The appendix, which we pulled out of the main plan, is really for our stakeholders. There's three appendices, uh, A, B, and C, that actually show where do you get money? So if I'm looking at the federal government, where do I actually find dollars? And there are some suggestions on maybe where we could do more at the federal level. And then as you get, you know, lower and lower, you know, local governments don't have a lot of options on revenue. And so you'll see that, you know, the number of pages get down, but it really does outline the potential revenue sources. Uh, this document, I'll be perfectly honest with you all, I could have brought it to you a year ago, and I decided to sit on it, mainly because I wanted to see how our federal authorization went. And then with COVID, we wanted to have a better sense that we were doing a document that was valid to the moment, that it wasn't basically aged before we even got it through the, the EPA for their, you know, their certification. So over this last several months, the second piece you'll see is a memorandum from the Balmoral Group. I asked Balmoral because they have a really strong economic team to take a look at our document, do a peer review, answer three questions. And, and those three questions is, was our cost estimate valid? Is it reasonable that $5 billion? And the answer was yes. Then I asked them, you know, in the world of water infrastructure and habitat restoration and monitoring, is there enough money in the marketplace, federal, state, and local, to think that we could do $250 million a year if we did that $5 billion over 20 years? And the answer was yes. And you'll see there's two different scenarios, kind of a high risk, low risk. And I think it's important that everybody know that none of this is guaranteed. So, you know, one of the conclusions is we don't have enough money on the table for the Indian River Lagoon right now to do this work in 20 years. So public will, political will, all that has to come together. And as Jackie mentioned, we are looking at historic levels of funding, you know, thanks to Governor DeSantis and the DEP water management districts, you know, just recently 53 million in, you know, wastewater and septic infrastructure. These are historic levels of funding that will get us there. But if we could get to 250 million a year, we could complete this, you know, in 20. And one of the 
assumptions in this Balmoral report, and we talk a lot about it, one or two technology transformations could change the game to our benefit, you know, both in cost and timeline. So imagine you know, an add-on to a septic tank that takes a $10,000 septic to sewer conversion, and you know, for $2,500 you could add something to the tank, and now all of a sudden you have nitrogen and phosphorus removal. Uh, that technology doesn't exist right now, but those are the kinds of investments that need to be made if we're going to accelerate both the efficiency and the effectiveness of, of our work. And so there are also some big ideas. So we took a little gamble and said, you know, if we were thinking differently about whole ecosystem restoration, you know, what are some of those thoughts? And so if you adopt this document today, uh, EPA will go through its certification process. Um, I think it's worth mentioning, should either the communication plan or this plan get anything substantive in change from EPA, we'll be bringing those changes back to you uh, in February. We're not anticipating them. And in fact, I want to thank Region 4 and headquarters. Uh, we've had input on the finance plan you know, since the very beginning. And, and so we want to really thank our EPA partners. They are not obligated to look at this in advance. And they have been really, really active in guiding us because uh, we took this to a level that uh, they haven't seen before. So with that, I'm open for questions. Any questions? Doug. Yeah, I've said this before, but it's no secret that anybody who didn't make water their number one prior priority in the last elections, they're sitting at home right now. The people that did, like Gail Harold, Senator Mayfield, Congressman Mast, they're, they're serving us right now. So we've got the quan, the, the reasons to do this are the right reasons. I just think we push as hard as we possibly can because now's the time to push that agenda for this issue. Great. Thank you. And was that a motion also to finance, <laughs> to adopt the uh, finance plan for the CCMP? Okay. Second. All right, we have a motion by Doug um, Bornig, seconded by Commissioner Adams. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much. Okay, our next item this morning is planning for the fiscal year 2023 NEP workforce analysis presented by Dr. DeFries. I will mention it in my report in a little more detail, but uh, we are beginning our five-year program evaluation uh, with the EPA. Uh, this is a deep dive into programmatic effectiveness uh, that happens every five years. And when we did this, actually, I'd just gotten hired. We had to do a five-year. One of the issues that EPA was concerned about, and you know, we've talked about this together in, in a number of meetings, is you know, is our workforce adequate to the workload uh, that we have uh, with a lagoon that's in crisis? And so uh, this workforce analysis uh, addresses that issue. It's not here for adoption, but we want your guidance because staff and I have spent a, a lot of time thinking about where we are at the moment, what we have to do at the moment, but where we want to go over the next three to five years as it relates to workforce. So this is where we are right at the moment, and I show this only to show you how many titles we all have below our actual title. So in my case, I'm your executive director, I'm the senior administrator, I'm your intergovernmental affairs coordinator, I'm also your senior scientist. And a lot of NEPs actually have at least one position for each of those. And so I want to just thank my staff. I mean, if you wanted to define jacks of all trades, you know, we all have been juggling an awful lot of job titles now for six years. And we believe we're at that point where we need to address uh, an expansion of staff. But we didn't do this in a vacuum. We decided to take a look at our other NEPs around the nation. You can see kind of where we sit. And there's no way to do this, you know, really accurately because they're all structured a little differently. Some of the smaller staff programs may be nestled 
in like their Department of Environmental Regulation where they've got all sorts of additional support. And so we broke it down by watershed. And uh, we are amongst five NEPs that have four full-time employees. We are the largest of those five. But if you look at the, the other NEPs you know, close to us, like Mobile Bay, you know, Santa Monica, you know, I think is, is kind of a, you know, an oddity. We have some really highly, you know, large staff programs. Uh, we're not proposing to become that. You know, one of the things you all, when you hired me six years ago, you said, let's stay lean and mean. And so the proposal that we'd like you to consider, we still believe is lean and mean, but it will move us forward. So what we'd like to do is to get some direction from you uh, on this proposed structure. And if you are in agreement that this is a, a, a good path to be thinking about as we move forward, then my staff and I will begin to craft our fiscal year 2023 budget around this possibility. And in February, we'll come back you know, with the, the vision and the financial reality. And we'll see if, if this is something that is financially doable in the short term. Is it gonna take a little bit longer time to get there? So if you look on your right, GIS coordinator scientist, uh, I think you saw the value of what KJ is doing for us right now. You know, I'd like to make that value, and I'm gonna be honest, I'm gonna put her on the spot. I'd like to make KJ you know, where we would move from where we are to add that GIS coordinator and IT specialist, and in fact, she's also a scientist, into our full-time employee once we uh, finish the DEP grant, which is currently funding her. So that would be in addition, that would be my first priority. Second priority is to uh, hire three community engagement coordinators. And there was a lot of discussion uh, within both the STEM AC and the management board. They immediately wanted to say, okay, yeah, we support this, but what, we don't like the name, what you're calling them. So we heard about Ambassador. And so let's not dwell on the name. The idea is that these three hires would be working locally. And so they would not be housed here with us. We would have one in, in Volusia, North Brevard, one located central, and one located south. They would serve very much, not only as a liaison to the local communities and the many cities and the counties, but they would be a physical presence, especially on weekends where we have so many public events you know, and, and workshops that we simply uh, with our current staff uh, can't get to. And, and many times, even myself, you know, I would like to be at every water management district meeting. And just because of travel times, very often I'm just watching on, you know, on the YouTube or online. So these would be a very unique mix of, you know, science background, understanding the community, uh, but also uh, people who can help chase money for our local partners. Uh, many of you know, every year for the last almost five years now, we've budgeted $40,000 to support grants, so free grant consulting to any of our partners who need a grant writer. And what we're hearing is some of these smaller communities have a gap between, you know, what to actually ask for and writing the grant. And so they just don't have the staff or the capacity to say, okay, this is what we can do, this is how we could prioritize, and then somebody actually put the concept together that you could then take to a professional grant writer to go get the money. So we see these three uh, positions as filling that gap to assist local partners in identifying where dollars are, but also helping to prioritize projects that are local. And so with that, I'm just gonna open up for questions. If you, you know, feel that this is an appropriate direction for us, then we'll go ahead and start to think through uh, the financial considerations for this. 
uh, and, and come back to you in, in February. If you, this is not where you wanna go, give us a little direction for our 2023 fiscal year. Great. Madam Chair. Aaron. It appears the uh, proposal with community engagement aligns and is consistent with what we heard earlier about the need to champion everything the NEP is doing, the projects, um, garner that local interest and engagement and investment, and then that would feed, continue to feed uh, the, the goals of, of this group as well as all of our agencies. That's correct. And I'll share with you, uh, you know, Chuck and I both serve on the Harmful Algal Bloom Task Force. Um, we had a presentation from uh, University of Florida, IFAS, on communicating red tides. And my re red flag went up, you know, partially because I'm old. But, you know, when you ask everybody today, you know, where do you get information? You know, I just kind of assume everybody's going to say social media these days. And what was interesting about this very deep dive into red tide <clears throat> communication was that it was personal communication. And, and some of the trusted, so the most trusted website on Red Tide is FWC, but that most people were getting their information from friends or neighbors. And, and that really surprised me, the power of you know, personal relationships somehow showed up in that survey they did, which I think you know, is, is where we're headed. And, and where we've been, we just can't cover the territory. And that is it's you know, having somebody like Bob come up and speak to you as a citizen. You, you just can't you know, make that happen on Zoom you know, electronically. That face-to-face -face is important. Great, thank you. Jackie. I just wanted to make the um, connection to Kathy LaMartina uh, from the South Florida Water Management District who is a regional representative. And I think that some of the most important positions in the South Florida Water Management District are the regional representatives. And I see that very similar to this uh, community en engagement coordinator. And without that person, you wouldn't have someone in your community who can help you with things, who can connect you with things. I think it is as important as an executive director because you, you have to hone those on the ground relationships uh, to hone the interest, to get the money flowing, to get the support going. And so I think these are wonderful uh, positions. Thank you. Commissioner Adams. Yeah, just to follow up on the two prior comments, I think, you know, starting with the JS coordinator is going to be the most important from the perspective of that people come to us or look to us to have the data that they need to make decisions. So we really need to be putting the effort into housing that data. And I think you have done a fantastic start. Your presentation was awesome. A little over my head in some points, but super, super awesome. <laughs> um, and we've talked about this over the years being that clearing house for that type of data. So I totally agree. And then the community engagement coordinators, you know, this is such a large region. It is impossible for us to expect you guys to be at each community neighborhood association meeting that requests somebody, to be at each council meeting where they're discussing grants and projects, and to have that person that's able to go in and give some input when Indian River County is trying to discuss a stormwater project, or you have the city of Felsmere that's looking for some grant opportunity to do some type of, you know, different treatment facilities or whatnot, is really where we should be going. And we as a board have talked about this for several years. So I definitely think it's time to put our money where our mouth is and see if there's a way we can make it work. Thank you. Commissioner Brower. Just a quick question. I think I know the answer. I see three of these positions for the community coordinator are reporting to Kathy Hills. Will that help her accomplish more? Or are you buying her a bigger treadmill? <laughs> <laughs> the only way, you know, this isn't a bigger treadmill is that Kathy uh, becomes focused on the communication piece. And then all the other things that she does, uh, which includes, you know, some contract oversight, 
you know, chasing me around, you know, to make sure I get my job done, you know, that, that shifts as well. So this would be a reorganization, you know, for all of us. Uh, one of the things I'm looking forward to is once these planning documents are completed, you know, I've had to have a very heavy oversight on the technical ones. And so I'm seeing my role with you shifting as well, uh, where I'm gonna have some additional time uh, where I'm not overseeing the science on some of these technical docs. Uh, but you're right, yeah, this isn't gonna, you know, we're gonna have to reorg everybody to this. And the one area I'm still a little nervous about, we'll talk about in my report, is Dan. You know, Dan is currently overseeing 40 contracts. He's getting support from Ashley on invoicing, uh, but that's a heavy load. And when we look at what may be coming in the next few months with federal infrastructure money, you know, we're gonna have to bring that into the discussion when we see in February. Great. Thank you. Doug. Yeah, I, what, what the staff here has done, uh, the four of you, is nothing short of a miracle, mm -hmm. considering our, our quarterback's been in the hospital fighting COVID and cancer. And uh, it's just unbelievable we have the most diverse, biologically complex lagoon system in the United States of America. We need, and you guys are the quarterbacks to this. We've been needing to do this for a long time. And now that we, I think we've got the assets and the support to take it to the next step. And I wholeheartedly support this. You all need help in the biggest way. You've, you've been phenomenal. I'm just, I, I couldn't be more supportive of this concept and of you all putting this together. I think I'm, I'm overwhelmingly in support of this. Green. So, was that a motion, Doug? Because if so, I'd, I'd, happy, I'd be happy to <laughs> second it. Okay. Aaron, you have a comment too. Yeah, uh, uh, as you put on the square footage of, of area to make the point of, you know, the size of the Indian River Lagoon. Doug mentioned as well, if there was such a thing as an ecological complexity coefficient that you could <laughs> add to that. I know some of those larger um, systems um, are different, uh, but maybe not as complex or have nearly the variety of issues and, and inputs and stressors and uh, all the various things, currents, ecology, everything. So you put that on there and I think it would move the uh, IRL up to the top of the, the list, so. And I would, I would echo all the sentiments that my colleagues just shared, and, um, and I believe that those four positions will show a huge return on investment. We will, we will, we will see that um, in the dollars, in the community outreach, and I think it's going to um, demonstrate a return on investment. And with that, if no one, no further comments, then we have a motion by, oh, go ahead, Doug. People talk to me because I'm kind of hey, through all these years of being the face of citrus and now I'm on the water board, they think corral me. And I spent my whole lunch trying to convince pretty volatile people what we're doing. They go, what, what the hell is going on with what we're doing? And then I, I at Carson's the other day, I was debating some guys, Kevin Powers, and I, and others were sitting there just trying to defend what we're doing. And uh, Kevin was on the St. John, our South Florida board. And uh, <laughs> these people gathered around us that we're arguing. We don't, you know, we never hear anything. We don't know anything. This is just, from just what just happened to me in Carson's and the Ocean Girl the other night, this is perfect. <laughs> <laughs> We'll have to be in every restaurant and every bar in seven counties. And we didn't know you were sneaking into Martin County so much either. <laughs> so we'll be on the lookout at Carson's now. <laughs> yeah, so now you know where Doug's yeah, doing his business. Right. <laughs> oh, okay, great. With that, we have a motion by uh, Doug and seconded by Commissioner Adams. All those in favor? Uh, Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much. And we'll bring, the, uh, you know, I'm going to look at Dan now and start squeezing that budget to see what yep. we can do this next fiscal year. Good, we look forward to you bringing it back. And our um, next item is the IRL Council Leadership Transition Policy. Uh, this is a simple uh, IRL Council policy. So this is your policy 
And, and it, it's really just a business repositioning, you know, and looking at our existing policies, you know, which were all created back in 15, 16. You know, we've, we've got a gap in leadership transition planning. And so what this does, uh, both in an unforeseen event, uh, if you lose your executive director, or a planned event, it, it puts a couple of immediate actions in play without having to convene an emergency board meeting. And so in, in an unforeseen event, Kathy, who is your deputy director, as soon as that event happens, becomes your acting director without having to come back to you all. She's got signature authority, because I, if you remember, uh, back in May, you gave me uh, the authorized power to convey that signature, which I did immediately, so we've got a backup. And so we've taken a few steps, you know, first the deputy director for backup, and then the signature power. This is really the third step to make sure that you as a board never wind up in what I would call an emergency situation where staff isn't able to act on your behalf in the absence of an executive director. Provides enough guidance in here in a, a plan uh, transition uh, to give you the basic tools to go ahead and, and go out uh, and, and do a, a search, but it also provides some opportunities in policy uh, to encourage internal candidates who are qualified to not only apply to move up the the ladder of leadership in our program, but also to make sure in that move up uh, that they are not you know, constrained. And, and I have seen this before, both in private sector and, and in public. You know, all of a sudden, somebody gets appointed as an acting director at the loss of an executive director. And all of a sudden, the whole system shifts over where that individual isn't looked at as a potential candidate from within because they're acting. And so there's some language in here that actually puts Glenn, our attorney, in charge of any interactions that you would have. Uh, you didn't know about this, um, <laughs> but he is on billable hour. Uh, but anyway, as your attorney, Glenn would be kind of the point for any leadership transition uh, so no staff are put in a compromising position um, and they can compete equally, you know, with any other qualified candidates. And ultimately, you know, I serve at your pleasure. You know, I'm a contract employee to you. You know, I assume that, you know, should that transition happen that you'll follow the same, you know, process. But it's just a very simple policy document to cover some of those gaps. Any comment? The only comment I would make is I read, I've read through it. I think it's fantastic. I think it's much better to have a clear plan in place before there's a crisis so it's very clear to everybody or just before there's a transition. I'm, I'm a big believer in succession and transition planning um, because it just makes what could be a very bumpy road so much smoother that everybody knows what to expect. Um, if and when something happens. So I think this is a great document. I think it's very well thought through um, and it will provide that continuity that we need going into anything expected or unexpected. So I would be happy unless there's other comments to make a motion for approval. Okay, I agree. The motion then by Commissioner Adams to adopt the um, leadership transition policy and a seconded by Aaron. Great, and I, I actually, as a board member, thank you for the foresight in putting together a policy, um, less us crafting it on the fly when um, we need it. So with that, um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much. And we have our uh, 2022 legislative priorities. So each year, um, and thank you very much for this, you give me a lot of authority and latitude to use my judgment on your behalf uh, when we're going into both federal and state legislative activities. Um, and I do really appreciate and, and take that responsibility 
very carefully. You know, each of you represent your own organizations that have organizational interests, and then our collective organization, and so I take that into consideration. But I always think it's good for us to be on the same page going into a session. And so I just want to run through uh, where we think we are, and then add two that are not on this list. You know, one was suggested uh, in the management board, and, and then one just came up. Uh, Glenn and I spoke for a minute as it relates to Sunshine. So under the federal side, uh, supporting full appropriation uh, for NEPs uh, with a $1 million target. And so if you rem remember back almost a year ago, uh, we were reauthorized in January of 2021 uh, at $50 million, up from 26.5. It was a significant increase. Uh, theoretically, uh, if we were uh, appropriated at the full amount that was authorized, you know, we would see just a little bit over a million dollars each, depending on how EPA uh, broke down the equation. You know, I was calculating about 1.4. Uh, both House and Senate appropriations committees uh, right now are in agreement, even though we don't have a budget for 23 yet, uh, at 750000 So that's what we will be budgeting to uh, based on our baseline for 2023. Uh, this is just sticking with what we've had the last three years, saying a minimum of $1 million. They're authorized at a higher amount, We'd like to see it appropriated to close to the full amount if possible. Second bullet, support funding for water infrastructure in the bipartisan bill. The fact is that bill has passed. I'll talk about what I'm expecting. Uh, the key now is to move those dollars through the agencies and get them to the street. And so I'll talk about that in a little bit. So we still have work to do with our partners. And, and also, this is a a classic story of if we had more people, uh, there's going to be a bunch of grant programs. And I'm already seeing grant opportunities now that our current staff simply don't have the time to go chase dollars that are available. Nor do we have the staff to deliver those if we got them. Third bullet is expediting and expanding groundwater uh, contamination remediation sites. I know you all have heard about you know, PFAS and PFOA, you know, many of those sites are on federal lands, you know, aviation airstrips, any place that we've had, you know, use of fire retardant foams. Third one is supporting uh, IWEA, the America Water Infrastructure Act. Uh, this is the primary source of funding for Everglades restoration. We want to see appropriations to the full amount possible in WERDA. Spanning expedite funding for uh, IRL South projects, and we've got some really good news. Maybe Jackie will mention, you know, some of these IRL South projects are coming online. So we are making progress in Everglades, thanks to the state uh, investment and the fact that the feds have been coming to the table with us in those investments. Uh, continue to work with our partners to explore federal projects. Uh, this is not a nuanced big picture. Uh, Brevard County has sent letters uh, to the uh, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to take a look at infrastructure associated with Kennedy Space Center. And so we want to be part of that discussion, whether it could be habitat restoration at causeways, could be flow improvements, which we've all talked about at causeways. Uh, there's also discussions right now about a possible new wastewater treatment plant. Uh, next one, um, expand harmful algal bloom funding and seagrass research. I think you're going to see this come through NOAA primarily. Uh, but, you know, this can't be one-shot funding. You know, if we're going to be doing seagrass restoration, manatee protection, you know, looking at harmful algal blooms, you know, this is a long game and the feds need to be in it for a long haul because there's much work to be done on a national level. And lastly, uh, funding for innovative technology. You know, I've often said this in public presentations. I, I wish we had a DARPA for water. 
You know, DARPA is the Defense Advanced Research Agency that works to do technology, you know, for DOD. And gosh, if we had a level of investment, state and federal, that could really push innovation and disruptive technologies, you know, that would pay dividends for decades to come, you know, if we can increase efficiency, decrease the timeline to delivery, and that's going to take an investment. So that is the federal level. I don't have anything to add to this other than I'm excited about where we are, a little confused about what this next year is going to look like as far as revenue, but we know the bipartisan infrastructure bill is going to be moving a tremendous amount of funding to infrastructure. Uh, as we move forward. So let's just take that one. Is, have I forgotten anything that's important to you all uh, that needs to be on my radar as we move forward? Any comments or suggestions? Jackie. Jackie. Sorry I'm talking so much today. Obviously I've been in my room a long time <laughs> alone uh, looking at Zooms. Would you go back to the first slide? First of all, the fantastic things. This is just uh, something I, I think I've brought up with you before and something I try to bring up every time I can because I'm really worried about it, um, where it says um, build coastal resilience. That's fan fantastic. I just always try to bring up the Army Corps of Engineers program, Building with Nature, yes. where so that as we're hardening our shorelines and we're fighting against sea level rise, that we don't turn our gorgeous state into a concrete jungle and that we can implement the use of natural systems, natural uh, vegetation. And the, the, if anybody hasn't seen it, if you go online and look up uh, Building with Nature, which is a registered trademark yes, of the Army Corps of Engineers, it is fascinating. And, and it talks, too, about working with the powers of nature, working with the movements of nature which we haven't always done in the past. So uh, I just hope that that's the kind of resiliency that we support. Thank yes, you. and I, we've got a lot of work to do on that as it relates to you know, both how local governments and even the state of Florida, there's so many opportunities in this building with nature sphere that we need to explore <laughs> opportunities and think outside of the box. And you, you know we've all been in discussions with DOT on 528. You know, the fact is there are things being done, habitat restoration projects, where you get better resiliency using nature than you would have with, you know, hard armoring to begin with. And so we just need to be open to those opportunities. Sometimes it takes a little bit more work and sometimes it's a little bit more cost, but the cost benefit uh, is, is much higher. So, you know, we really need to continue to push that concept through the NEP, but also work with our local communities that are still grappling with, you know, zoning issues and how you build. It's, it's hard to get that ship turned to look at new and innovative ways to do business when it's related to stormwater or or infrastructure development, but you're absolutely right. Without that, we're not going to get to where we need to be. Great. And with that, we're, I'm looking for a motion to adopt the legislative priorities and authorize our executive director to engage in policy discussions. Thank you, Commissioner Adams. Second. Seconded by Commissioner Brower. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Very good. Motion carries unanimously. Thank, Thank you very you. much. State of Florida, I try to stay general, uh, mainly because it's almost impossible to anticipate what's going to come through the state of Florida for bills every year. And uh, you all have given me a lot of ability to, you know, see what's alive, you know, and, and you know, bills are dropping, you know, by the dozens right now. And it's almost impossible to keep up with every bill that drops. And then unless you read the entire bill, you know, it's hard to figure out sometimes what that bill is trying to do. And so uh, we keep this somewhat generic, but I want to add two for your consideration at the end. Uh, 
We want to thank the EP for your continued support and both water management districts. I mean, that is central to our foundational financial stability. And uh, many of you may remember, but DEP has us in their recurring budget. And so that's going to be super critical. And I never want to forget your investments in us as a program, because it is the basis of how we operate. Item number two is cost share. We have seen the power of local cost share over the last several years. It's really remarkable. And I'll just give you an example from our own program. When I first took over in 15 and 16, you know, our typical cost share was one to one. So every dollar that we put in an RFP, the locals were bringing about a dollar back. Now it's six to one. So the local communities are bringing more money to the table. And even though that ratio is shifted, the fact that you've got partnerships and match and we're sharing responsibility and investment costs, it really does make a difference. So we focus on wastewater, stormwater, coastal resilience, legacy pollutants, habitat restoration, and innovation, innovation and technology. And we're saying, you know, put more state funds into these areas where you've got local cost share match. And, and most of these are actually active programs right now. We need to thank our state legislators and the governors for their investments over the last couple of years. It's been historic. Uh, but we have to continue this investment level if we're going to get there. And so the two that I'd like to add, or at least get some direction from you, at our management conference, there was a suggestion from one of our conference members that you know, we were missing low impact development. And low impact development, and there was uh, you know, some discussion uh, because a lot of low impact development decisions aren't made at the state level, they're made at the local level with local comp plans. And there's a lot of sensitivity to home rule issues right now. And so you know, we didn't add it, but I, you know, I think when we look at our support for stormwater, you know, I could just add, including urban stormwater improvements, large regional dispersed water management, low impact development projects on, on both. You know, so with that addition, you know, I think we've at least addressed something we've already uh, stated in our CCNP how important low impact development policies are going to be. Uh, but without getting too far into the weeds about how that gets delivered, I think that's where we would make the addition. So, Madam Chair, I'd like to take that as a first recommended addition and, and see where you all are. Okay. Comments? Doug. I brought this up before, Duane. Um, I've had my boat in three major marinas in Jensen Beach and now in Stewart, two of their marinas. And I just have been analyzing what they do when they, I put my boat on a wash rack when I get out of the water with it. And everybody rubs and scrubs and loves their boat with safe detergents and safe cleansers. But I, I've looked at all three marinas and all three still from the cement pad, they wash right back into the Inyavira Lagoon. <clears throat> I, I'd, I'd like to see up for all marinas a, a marina program, because I'm sure if those three do it and they're, they're Top drawer marinas, very good marinas. They're not trying to pollute, but it was their effort to get the washing and scrubbing out of the lagoon directly onto a pad. But when rain, rain comes, it washes right back in. So if there's a, something you could plug in here for a marina cost share program, um, you know, they, they, and the marina I'm in currently, they handle 50, 55 boats a day, and about 20 of them go in wash racks, and you do the math on that one marina all the way up to Volusia County, that, that's a lot of direct discharge right into the lagoon and, and to Manatee Pocket, which we, which Kathy LaMartina helped get dredged. Well, we're putting a lot of crapola right back in indirectly. So, 
And they don't mean to do that. They think they're doing great. Being, and I thought for a while, this is wonderful that we're out of scrubbing like we did 30, 40 years ago right in the river. We put on a rack, we're doing our share, but you're really not. It's ending up right back in into the river. And the other marinas I, I was in did the sex, do the exact same thing on, on the cement slab. So, And you don't want to penalize those marinas. I'm not, my goal is not to do that. It was just incentivize them to put a gutter system that's caught and put in their, their, their sewer system or somehow divert that into a, a swale rather than directly back in the lagoon, something that has a care to it that will make it work for the marinas. Because they're trying to do the right thing, their wash racks. We just we don't want to put the bullwhip to their back and say, you're still not doing right. Well, I, I want to give them money to say, let's take that next step. So. Now, I think that might be an appropriate additional bullet. Um, we've been talking that DEP has a clean marina program. You know, over the course of last year, they were beginning to re-energize that, recognizing that, you know, some of the marine, clean marinas, you know, hadn't been looked at for a long time. Uh, there's a fair amount of concern about liveaboard boats right now. and even boats that are not pumping out and doing direct discharge to the lagoon at marina sites. Um, and some of those have gone to enforcement that we're aware of on O'Galley in particular in, in Brevard County. So you know, I think that, you know, something along the lines of, you know, continue to support, you know, the FDEP clean marina program, you know, or support and expand. I think expand, that would be appropriate. Yeah. Get, get, give them the resources, the marinas, to take that next step, because I know they're, um, well, marinas aren't expanding anymore just because it, environmentally is such a huge impact. So the, the marinas that are currently there are probably the marinas we're going to have for the next you know, few decades, um, if we're lucky. Uh, and, and they're getting crushed with the popularity of boating. Boating and sales have gone through the roof. So. If we could expand that program, I think we'd catch a lot of point source pollution basically right there in the marinas that they're, that's going right in the lagoon. So, Yeah, and um, uh, some of those facilities might also be regulated under the NPDES stormwater requirements, uh, multi-sector general permits for that type of activity, which we regulate and do compliance checks on, make sure that BMPs are met and various things. So uh, I made a note that we'll... Um, see where we're at with that particular sector of uh, compliance and uh, maybe do some work there. Yeah, if we just help them. I, yep. I want to give them money to take that next step because it's not a big step to gutter and put it in a swale. It's not, it could be engineered easily with a little bit of financial help for these marinas. So anyway, thank you. So do we have some consensus that we would add a bullet for um, support and expand the um, clean, DEP's clean marina program? Yes. Right. I'm seeing. Good. Thank you. And, um, and additionally add the low impact development under the stormwater right. bullet? Yeah. Okay. Was it? Go ahead. I just have a, a question on that. And I I agree with your idea, and so I don't mean to be controversial, but I'm, I'm wondering if, if boat sales are up and marinas are busy and money is already short for this, do we need to, to give them essentially taxpayer money to do the right thing to protect the marina, well, protect the waterways? Here. We're trying to help them go to this next step and not penalize the, the Marines. 
Okay. Yeah, I agree completely that it, it needs to be done. I guess I'm just concerned about who, who pays for it. And I think where that came in was your, your terminology of cost share, which the clean marina, um, supporting the clean marina DEPs wouldn't have um, include cost share functions, would it? I don't think so. I, most of this has been, at, in the past, has been certifying marinas as clean based on good practices at the marina. And then, you know, you got to continually follow up to make sure that those practices don't erode over time, or if a marina switches hands, you know, that the managers are, are fully aware of their obligations if once they've been designated as a clean marina. But uh, much like agricultural, you know, BMPs, you, you, we would want every marina in Florida to be a clean marina, have them all meet that obligation. So. You know, that falls within the DEP program, kind of expanding the, the number of marinas that come into full compliance under that program, which is voluntary, as I understand. You know, there are regulatory uh, compliance oversights on all marinas, and, and then it's just there's this whole other suite of voluntary things they could be doing, you know, just to enhance operations. and. Right. You're right, you know, there's not a lot of oversight on who's using what kind of soaps when they wash down a, a, a boat these days. Kind of hard to regulate, hard to enforce, but a lot of this is education. Yeah, I think that's all you want to do is tell them how and, and <clears throat> give them a little bit of seed money to get it done. It's not a big step. I don't think the next step's going to be costly. Any other additional comments? Commissioner Smith. Yeah, I, I'm in 100% agreement with what you're saying, except that, to Jeff's point, if marinas are doing so well financially, and I come from the private sector, I'm not a politician. I was in the private sector for about 40 years, and I understand the, the cost of doing business. And I would think the cost of doing business uh, sometimes is appreciated by the business owner and sometimes not so much. And some business owners like to cut corners and don't do what they're supposed to do. I owned a body shop in one of my businesses and there were many body shops in my town that didn't do the things that I did. So to strictly put this on the back of the marinas and allow them to make the decision whether they're going to do it or not, I'm not so sure I agree with that. Sure, if you owned the marina, you would do it. I think if anybody up here owned the marina, they would do it. Maybe they wouldn't do it unless they were made aware of it. So that's another issue, education. But, and if you're saying it's not that costly, I don't see it would be breaking the back, of any, back right now of any marina owner that is making money hand over fist because of the situation we're in right now. So, but I'm guessing that's going to be a, a state issue that we would have to appeal to our state legislators, both in the House and in the Senate. And I don't think it would be a hard sell. That's my two cents in support of what you're saying. And of kind of in support of what you're saying. Right. I think it's something that should be done. I do too. Uh, Aaron. Final, uh, final comment or, or suggestion. Uh, talking generally, as Doug brought up, regarding marinas and, and having them um, you know, operating in a way that's uh, creating less pollution um, is the general idea. I don't know, I'm not sure the operations and the mechanism of the clean marina program. I'm rusty <coughs> on their um, implementation and what they specifically do. So I don't know if that's the specific mechanism. So I wouldn't name that specifically as the fix, uh, but maybe focus on the general issue and idea. So add some language then we're suggesting to support clean marina. Clean, clean marinas, yeah. So uh, the, I, again, I'm rusty on the functioning of the clean marina program and um, what their capabilities are now or going forward. Um, that'd be a policy uh, matter. But 
I think the general idea of um, making sure that marinas are polluting less and managing their waste correctly and their stormwater and their runoff correctly, um, I would add that in there. I just don't know what mechanism uh, would be used to ensure that. I think there's some regulatory items already on the books, uh, legislation, existing programs, so I, I would leave it more general uh, as far as the mechanism that's implemented to address well, We that. can do that. Typically, we're not crafting or recommending legislation. We haven't done that in the past, and we're not doing it here, but we're setting some broad categories. So if, in fact, a bill was filed on clean marinas, you know, I have some direction from you, you know, to, to enter into that discussion if I get called by a House or a Senate member. And, and it does happen quite often where, you know, both in draft bill drafting and as bills are moving through committee, I will get phone calls and they'll say, take a look at this bill, what do you think? And so where I've got a little bit more specific guidance, you know, I can go a little deeper and where I've got broad guidance, our position is we support clean marina operations, you know, and, and the clean marina program in, in DEP. And, you know, that's kind of the, the context of, of the discussion. Okay. We have some consensus. Did we, did we have another bullet point on the next? Uh, well, I've got one more bullet point that Glenn uh, sent me a little note and he said, do we want to start to explore the possibility of amending uh, Sunshine Law uh, to allow for advisory groups like ours uh, to be able to work operationally within the law using Zoom? And you know, I've thought about this a lot. I know that's like you know, trying to amend Sunshine Law. It's probably a big challenge. I don't see it happening this session probably too late to start it, but it's a good time to start a conversation. I can tell you that, especially with our citizens, you know, and especially with gas prices the way they are, you know, driving down, you know, 50, 80, 100 miles to a meeting, you know, becomes both a time constraint and could be financial constraint. And if we could do our advisory meetings by Zoom with votes, uh, that would be super helpful. And I can tell you, and, and some of you were here back, you know, in the day, there's a number of NEPs, uh, Tampa Bay is one, where they have identified their science advisory group, they call it the TAC, Technical Advisory Committee, as fact-finding only. And we made a decision, and I think it was the right decision, and I would support it again even now after six years, that by allowing our advisory committees to truly be advisory to you, the board, provides not only the power to the public, so to speak, uh, but also gives you a monitoring, you know, I mean a uh, management board, citizen advisory committee, science advisory committee who can actually make a recommendation to you. You know, we could have taken them all to fact-finding only, and then they would report to me, which is how Tampa Bay does it. And then back in the day when Caroline Anse was our, our counsel, we spent a lot of time looking at the pros and cons and felt that doing our work in the sunshine was better. But yeah, it's problematic for some of our volunteers, especially the scientists, uh, but that it was better to be totally open and, and so the only way we fix this where you can actually vote by Zoom is by changing Sunshine Law. It would be amendment to Sunshine for advisory groups. I know the county advisory groups, you, I think most of the counties are under the same legislative uh, mandate. What's interesting is the state agencies are not. So the state agencies are functioning on Zoom like our Harmful Algal Bloom Task Force. Everything we've done the last few months, even after the governor rescinded the emergency uh, rule on COVID, is, is by Zoom. We're voting by Zoom. And so there's a, you know, a, a, a discord between you know, what you can do as a state agency versus what 
local uh, communities can do and also what we can do as a special uh, district of the state of Florida. Glenn, you want to add anything to that? But this would be something I'd start to broach with a few you know, elected officials and see if there's any appetite. I don't have any illusion that this would go this year, uh, but it might be appropriate to start the conversation. Well, as Dwayne's indicated, it's, um, there are first off, there's hundreds of exemptions to the Sunshine Law. Um, and I don't know that it would be that difficult to craft an exemption that's very narrow just for the IRL Council and primarily because we're multi-jurisdictions. You know, we have many counties, folks come from all over, and I could see a realistic chance of that getting passed. The question is, do we want to go down that path? Um, because again, it's still, it's still transparent, it's still, the public can still participate, only it's Zoom, and as Dwayne mentioned, the state's been doing this for years, where they have statewide task force and statewide groups, and they realize from Miami to Tallahassee to Pensacola, you're not gonna have all these people come together, so they, have a whole process set up in the administrative code that allows them to meet by what they call communication media technology. Before there was Zoom, that was the phrase that was being used. So if you wanted to go down that path, that's what I would suggest, that we use that format. We don't reinvent the wheel. This is what's already in place at the state level. And we're more similar to a state agency than really a county or a city agency because we do cover the whole lagoon. Mm -hmm. I, I personally think that's a great idea. I think that um, it, maybe it is too late this this year, but I think you'll get a lot of support from other groups that are regional in nature that are having similar problems. And one of the things we're finding um, on at least some of the regional boards and groups that I sit on is trying to find volunteers and getting them to show up. You're having quorum issues. It, it's not just us. It's mm -hmm. not just the Lagoon Council. Um, we're having them locally for the same reason that people got used to Zoom and now I am asking you to take yourself away from work for three hours to come to a meeting and, and that's internally in Indian River County. So now if you look at it regionally, I'm asking you to take the day off of work to come to a meeting um, that, that could be accomplished just as effectively through Zoom, you know, within certain parameters. And because it is an advisory board, just like some of our committees in the county are advisory to the commission, we ultimately make that the decisions that come out of them, their recommendations. So I think this is a great idea. I think it would be much more efficient for um, the volunteers that we have working with us and for us, and it would help encourage more involvement, actually. Um, and I think, again, if you start down this road, you will find that there is probably some other regional kind of heavy hitting type of organizations that would be supportive and could help maybe move that ball forward too. Yeah, I agree. We, and particularly for Brevard County because we're 72 miles long. Mm -hmm. So we have seen a real growth in people not showing up in voluntary positions. And the Keys has the same problem. They're, they're 100 miles right. long. So it's definitely an issue. Yeah. Good. Jackie. I totally uh, support and empathize with what you're talking about. I, I was wondering if there is a way to have a hybrid system or something. You know, like people would have to come twice a year, three times a year. I don't know. I just think, um, for instance, like we all know each other and the people that are on those boards, they know each other. And so like if, if you start having a Zoom and you know each other, that's one thing because you already know each other from face to face. But in the future, if it's set up just as a video board basically or a Zoom board, I think that can really pose problems interpersonally. And, um, and also, I mean, the gas in the tank is relationships yeah. and relationships are still face to face. And so just if there's some way not to throw it all out, uh, I think it would be helpful. Or you, you know, you have to inspire that too. You, executive staff perhaps would have certain times where you inspire people to come and then let them do Zoom the rest of the time. I don't know, I'm just, I'm concerned about a total Zoom world because I, I think there will be less passion Staff agrees with you. We've talked about this a lot. There's nothing beats getting everybody in a room and having a conversation. Uh, but the ability to vote 
by Zoom takes away that likelihood that you can't vote because you don't have a quorum. But I think we would still, you know, convene our meetings, you know, and, and, and but people would be able to come in with Zoom, that we wouldn't be obligated. And it, maybe we split it, like you say, you know, we do an annual meeting or, or maybe two out of the four each year are, you know, we're really pushing for face to face. But uh, I, I think once, and, and Glenn, I think an exemption would allow for it, but wouldn't, you know, necessarily take away the, you know, the, the prime okay. goal is to have everybody in a room okay. together where you got a quorum. So they're not mutually exclusive. I think Glenn has some um, additional. To kind of maybe tr thread the needle, you can ask the legislature for a full exemption and you can still adopt policies that are more restrictive. Yeah. So you can say, okay, we now have this exemption, but we as a body have decided that we want one meeting, two meetings, however many meetings a year to have a physical quorum. So that right. may be enable you to kind of meet both those needs. Good. I agree. So, and that was the, the final bullet? That would be the final bullet. Just a point of clarification. So when we broach this subject, are, are we going to broach it generically, Glenn? Uh, or are we going to broach it as a specific just to the IRL Council? Because I know a number of you in the county government world are fighting the same issue. So do we start, you know, with, with IRL Council and then see if there's any appetite and then have people come in? Or do we broach this as a, you know, a local governance special district issue? So my suggestion would be that since we're here discussing it as the IRL Council, that we broach it from that perspective. But I would encourage y'all to reach out like to the Florida Regional Councils Association, the Association of Counties, the League of Cities, because I think everybody's going through their policy proposal process right now. Mm -hmm. And there's been discussions on with all of those about kind of this issue. Um, Personally, I think just kind of the way every the state of the world is right now, if we look at it as this is a regional board, this is not, you will have a better chance, I think, of getting something done than if it's Indian River County wants to have all their meetings Zoom. I mean, that's, that's really not, it doesn't tear at the heartstrings as much as Brevard County, which I get, but it doesn't tear the heartstrings as much as, you know, you have Volusia all the way down to Martin. That's a huge swath of the Treasure Coast. So I think if we kind of couch it, and the reason we're asking for this is it's a regional okay. committee. It's a regional group, and we have regional people coming to these advisory boards. And I agree with Susan. I, I think if we try and broaden it, we're just going to get in the weeds. Right. We just follow Glenn's advice and just us. It's, okay. And if other boards want to do it through their legislators, they can do it. Fantastic. So I'll need a motion on that one, so I think. Then we would need a motion to adopt the state legislative priorities, including um, adding the low impact language in stormwater. Um, and if it's to the, the um, pleasure of the board, um, adding broad language on clean marina best practices and education um, efforts. Sounds good to me. And um, supporting um, the amendment to regional boards like the Indian River Lagoon Council um, Sunshine. I will be happy to make that motion as you summarized it. Okay. Second. Thank, thank you. I'm sorry, who down there seconded? I did. Commissioner Smith. Okay, so we have a motion um, by Commissioner Adams, seconded by Commissioner Smith. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. Okay, we have a relatively simple item next, uh, the 2020 meeting calendar uh, adoption. Good afternoon. Um, looking forward at 2022 meeting calendar, I've outlined uh, the proposed meeting dates for the board of directors. And as you can see from the graphic on the right, um, our advisory committees. 
The one adjustment that the Citizen Advisory Committee would like to make is they would like to meet a week earlier in May to allow for some time for uh, the small grants to come through. So they're requesting that their uh, May 12th date be moved to May 5th, and that's the only kind of adjustment that we've had. Awesome. Great. Looks good to me. Okay. If no the, comments, I'll be happy to make a motion to adopt. Thank you. I have a motion by Commissioner Adams to adopt the 2020 meeting calendar. Second. Seconded by Aaron. Thank you very much. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're moving on to our um, staff reports, and our first staff report today is going to be the communication report by Kathy Hill. So I have some metrics for you. Um, we've been running ads and rerunning ads now. Um, just showing the metrics, uh, we did the boat, the leaky boat engine ad again. Um, this one ran in all five counties, about 80,000 impressions. So it was fed to about 80,000 people. 53,000 people interacted with the ad in some way. So they either liked it or clicked through to the website or you know did something with it. Um, the thing we're really pleased about is if you look at the demographics at the bottom, how nice and even those are. Um, so we are hitting all age groups with these. And uh, that is different from our usual audience. So we're very pleased about that. Fertilizer ad, um, uh, basically the same thing, 70,000 impressions, about uh, 43,000 people almost interacted with it. And you can see the demographics again, fairly even. Pet waste ad, um, this was a good one. Uh, almost 90,000 people looked at it. Wow. Um, almost 58,000 people interacted with it. And really good demographics. And then that was much higher than all the other ads we ran this time. And then the littering ad, 93,000 impressions, uh, 60,000 people interacting, and really good demographics again. And notice also here the, um, the young users, the 18 to 24-year-old crowd, is significantly higher than the rest of them. Um, website stats, getting about 1,300, uh, well, between 1,000 and 1,300 visitors per month. Um, usership goes up when there are meetings. So in meeting um, months, we get higher usership. People spend about... Um, Couple of minutes per page, two pages per session usually. Um, most folks are from Florida, and we can confirm that from the, um, the, the metrics that we get from the, uh, the websites. And I think you can see the, uh, the usership from people clicking through from social media and also the ads and what those generate in terms of usership. Facebook continues to go well. We are getting a 30 to 50 new followers every month, which is great. Um, and I've spoken to this before. We used to get about five per month. And since we've been doing the videos and running the ads, we're getting you know 30 to 50. So the, that all is moving in a good direction. Uh, Instagram. A little less so with this one. We, we don't really have this right. We're using Instagram as sort of an artboard, so we're recycling, <clears throat> excuse me, pictures from the, uh, <coughs> excuse me, from the uh, calendar, and just putting inspirational quotes and, and things like that with it. So um, not entirely sure that we're striking the right chord there, but we are building that audience somewhat, and uh, it's, it's moving in the right direction. And then Twitter, is our perpetual problem child. Uh, <laughs> we're going to find the place where Twitter is the sweet spot, but we'd ha we haven't found that yet. So we're, we're getting there, but uh, it's, it's very slow going. Uh, you can see our top tweets. Uh, and these are all done in the voice of the lagoon. So it's the lagoon has, the voice of the lagoon is the Twitter feed. Um, I think that's all I want to say about that. And so we're moving forward with the specialty plate. We'll be approaching um, highway safety and motor vehicles with the new art. And uh, we showed you last time the two, the two samples. Um, we ran this through the management conference during the previous meetings, and everybody liked uh, by consensus, even when there wasn't a quorum. But by consensus, everybody likes the, uh, the oil painting snook rather than the logo snook. So we're going to go with that one. 
and hopefully that will start right after the first of the year. Um, you know, we'll be able to buy back the old plates and put out the new one with uh, a minimum of cost. That's all for me. Great. Anybody have any questions? Thank you. Excellent. Great. Okay, we're going to do the um, IRL project updates. Dan. All right. So let's give you a, a rundown on where we are from the end of fiscal year. Um, what's nice about this is, you know, it kind of highlights some of these projects that we all get to uh, fund for the year. Um, we got to go with Doug and Jackie and um, uh, Commissioner Zazowski just last a uh, couple weeks ago to uh, the muck dredging site. So it was really powerful getting to actually see that um, project in action, and it'll be really nice to be able to have our new hires eventually come to these projects as they get finished and highlight them a little bit more detail than we get to see today. So at the end of 2021, we had 26 projects or activities still in progress. Um, all the new projects for 2022 are under contract, and there's 15 new ones. And then uh, during the last year, we finished 28 projects or activities, and 17 alone finished in the last quarter. And so I'm going to list all of them here for you to see. Um, I'm only going to kind of highlight just a few of them because I don't have time to go over all of them. Um, but I'll leave this up so you can read through all the different ones that we finished. And they all did come on, on budget or under budget. So and I highlighted some of them, um, how much we had in the savings on some of these projects. Yeah, and that's one of the ones I'm going to highlight here. Yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. thank you. And I mm -hmm. can just say that when we were obliterated by seven inches of rain just recently, and the whole all of Souls Point Road was flooded almost, and I went down to the new Margarita, dry as a bone. Wow. <laughs> All right. So the first project that I wanted to highlight out of these uh, is one that you might have seen several times because we funded it for several years. And the reason I brought it up is it highlights not only um, how much uh, pounds of shell gets recycled each year through this program, the Shuck and Share uh, at MDC. Um, UCF is kind of the prime on this project. They're the ones that lead it. Um, but there's a lot of people volunteering for this project. And it also highlights long-term monitoring. So some of the projects, they get thrown in the ground and then people walk away and they're done. This one they've been uh, monitoring for years. And you can see the success rate. So in that graph on the right, when they first started, they weren't getting as uh, much of a recruitment. And then in the last few years, it kind of perfected how they've been doing it and getting a lot more recruitment for oysters. So it just shows you how long-term um, monitoring really makes a difference. Uh, the second project is another big project that's really taken off. This is the CLAM project. It finishes its second year this year. Uh, we funded it last year as well. Uh, the map you see on the right shows all the locations of the clam leases that they've put out. I believe the ones in the yellow uh, were last year. The ones in red uh, were just added for this year. Right. And then the two in purple are additional funding mechanisms where a couple were put out. And the big one with this is, uh, you know, they, they put out almost 3 million juvenile clams at these leases scattered around. Um, but there's also 92 million larvae called villagers released. So it's not just 3 million, it's almost 93, 95 million clams put out each year. And this current year, year three that just started for fiscal year 2022, um, they're expanding even more, getting more partners involved and just really expanding this project. So it'd be interesting to see where it goes. And here is the Mandalay Margarita. So this was the oldest project we had left as an active project, finally glad we got to wrap it up. This is the placard that is at the site exact, um, that is there right now, so it kind of shows you um, all the partners, as well as a little design, how it functions. And then the last picture I have here uh, will show you what it actually looks like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have a couple other projects in here with some really good nature stuff. <clears throat> 
Uh, this next project um, you had last meeting come in, Martin County talk about their septic and sewer program. They did a big long presentation. They wrapped up their first year. They're currently doing their second year right now. Um, 150 homes are converted. Uh, the map you see on the right, all the red is kind of where they're targeting to put all those. Um, it's a 10 year program too, so they're going to do multiple home conversions. The ones in the yellow is where they finished this past prior year. And then you can see 4, 000, they're estimating 4,000 pounds of total nitrogen removed per year. Uh, this was an interesting project. This was ORCA. Uh, they did a buffered shoreline uh, demonstration project. This is down in Stewart at Shepherd Park. Um, they kind of planted all these plantings around the storm drains, and they did prior and post monitoring to see if there was a decrease in any kind of nitrate or phosphate runoff. And you can see on the graphs on the right there that they had some uh, pretty good results from uh, prior and post. And then there's a nice little uh, placard there at the site. And then lastly, this is in Commissioner Adams District, uh, the Jones Pier Project right there on the Jungle Trail. Uh, this is a massive uh, wetlands that was put in. Um, they have a really big uh, education center, uh, some boardwalks all the way around it, um, and then you can see all the buffered shorelines and planning with nature. So I just have a few pictures on this one I'll show you. Yeah, it's really beautiful. There's a lot of birds there already. Mm -hmm. And then there's a whole other phase of it that takes the historic Jones Pier and the house, and then it creates um, like a little history museum, and then also walks through the restoration and how it's bringing water out of the lagoon, cleaning it, and putting it back in. This is a really cool project. Mm -hmm. It's and really pretty. Uh, on top of that, there's going to be, uh, through our small grant, for funding the wet lab in that house. So that'll be an additional part that's going to finish up with this uh, current year. Get some more photos of it. The only thing missing is you can't pull up and get any river grapefruit anymore. Yeah. <laughs> I know, too bad there's one little stand, right? And last pictures. I'll just say, I, I really enjoy seeing the, the project highlights when you bring them. Yeah, and I think it really demonstrates uh, all of what we're doing here. Yeah, yeah it's, it's why we're doing it. I started this about a year ago, and I'm really <clears> excited to um, expand it through the staff. You know, KJ's going to be able to put together like a story map on our website so that we'll have this interactive touch to it. The community, you know, outreach people will show these, and then hopefully we can get people like yourselves and other um, community outreach people to, or um, people to show up to these projects. As we were talking, you, Jackie and I, that you drive by that uh, DMMA, you don't see it from the road. You don't see what's going on. So being right, able to absolutely. highlight the projects is huge. That's it. Great. Any questions? Thank you. Great update, Dan. Moving on to our executive director report, Dwayne. I'm going to go through mine relatively quickly, but first I want to let you know we've received a number of donations uh, in memory of uh, Mr. Michael Cavello, who, who died in an accident up in Cocoa Beach, and just wanted to take a moment to you know, give our regards and condolences to his wife, his family, and friends. Uh, but we've been receiving, you know, donations in his memory. We'll make sure uh, those go to a, a really good project, and we're going to reach out uh, to his wife and, and make sure she's involved in the process. Thought I'd take a second and just, you know, since I didn't get to see you in August, this is what last year looked like. We had a really good year considering all the challenges of COVID. I'm not going to go through this in any detail other than we continue to be project focused, that isn't going to change. I think the more projects we do, the more nutrients or pollutants get removed. You know, that's where the rubber hits the road for us. Um, I already talked about the concurrence documents. Uh, we will be sharing with you our climate ready estuary report. It's almost out of the printer. Uh, two peer review publications are already uh, published, and we have a citizen's guide to that, and we should all have that by the end of the month. And then, uh, you know, Kathy showed you all the communication, the vital signs, uh, but the big news is really, you know, what's happening at the federal level, and I'll talk about that um, 
in some detail uh, probably at our next meeting, but the infrastructure package that came through Congress has 132 million earmarked for the National Estuary Program. That was no small feat in getting a small program like ours with a line item in that infrastructure bill. Uh, thanks to Rich Ennis and uh, I think every one of us, uh, the 28 NEP directors engage with our congressional legislative delegations. Um, that's gonna look at, if everything works the way we think it's gonna work, we should be uh, budgeting an additional $915,000, uh, hopefully beginning in fiscal year 23. That will be above and beyond the 750 uh, in our normal approach. So we'll keep you posted once we see how these dollars start flowing through the agencies. Uh, workload focus, and I'm just gonna say we've got a lot coming up. So like we always do, we front load our year. And so we haven't let our foot off the gas at all. We've got a number of technical documents uh, moving forward. Tentative budget has to be to you in February and adopted before March 1. Legislative session is just about ready to begin. Uh, Kathy's working on the annual report. As soon as we have that, we'll get that in your hands. She's also, we will be sometime in what, a week, two weeks on the calendar? About two weeks, we'll be hand delivering calendars again and making sure everybody's got at least a box or two of uh, the 2022 calendar. So a lot coming up. This is an important one. Uh, we are back, it's hard to believe it's been five years going in six and we're back to a five year program evaluation with EPA. I want you to just make a note to kind of keep your calendars clear, if you can, between May 23rd and July 15th, and we'll narrow that down. EPA will do a full programmatic site visit. This is like an audit of program. And so we will have uh, three people on our review team, Vince Bacalan, who you've met, Jennifer DeMeo, our Region 4 coordinator, who you've met, and then Tom Ford will be an ex officio director from California uh, serving on this review and, and we'll probably have a week of activities uh, during that planned time. So just kind of keep that uh, on your agenda. We'll get back to you once we start to schedule. Uh, most importantly for me, however, is that report is due on April 1st. So I've got a lot of work to do between now and April putting that together. Manatee mortality event, um, I just want to mention this briefly. Uh, we've had two manatees now uh, that I'm aware of uh, that have been officially declared uh, dead because of starvation. One was a male back in early November. We had another animal just recently in the last uh, week or so. Uh, we are working closely with Florida Fish and Wildlife and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service um, as a partner and uh, they have stood up a, you know, basically an investigation team. We've been partnering on that. Uh, there's a lot of talk, uh, and you may be getting calls about are we feeding manatees this year? And the answer is we don't know yet. We're waiting for U.S. Fish and Wildlife to make a decision about provisioning animals. Uh, but in the interim, you know, what I've been telling everybody, and we've had a lot of media calls, is the long game to protect manatees is getting the water quality right. That we are not gonna see seagrass recovery till water quality gets to where it needs to be. And so uh, we need to be, you know, keeping our eye on the ball with nutrient reduction and all the projects that, uh, that you've seen that are underway uh, with all of our partners. That's gonna be the long game to recovery of seagrasses and stabilization of this manatee situation. Uh, but uh, expect a lot of press as we move forward. And we are all hands on deck on this one. We've offered our support as much as we can to the feds and to the state. And we'll be working with them on a regular basis as we move forward. And hopefully, you know, our worries 
don't come to fruition and that we don't see another repeat of last year. As of today, we're over 1,000 animals dead over the last 12 months. Federal legislative update, I'm not gonna go into this because I mentioned it already, uh, but we will be working with EPA. Our, our goal is to try to get money through the administrative process to the local NEPs as quickly as we can. My perfect world is that I'm coming to you in February saying we've got confirmation of whatever that amount is and that we can budget. And so you're probably gonna see you know, maybe two options. We're just not sure when you know, we'll get official word about how much and what the timeline for delivery will be. But we'll keep you posted along the way. And if you have questions, uh, by all means, uh, let me know. I sent each of you a summary of kind of where the ocean and coastal dollars are going. Um, I just got a, a summary of, a couple of weeks ago from Wes Brooks at DEP, who did a really nice additional summary. I'm gonna just send that to all of you so you have that. Some of it's repetitive and some of it was information that wasn't in that August document. So I'm gonna just send that individually to you so you can kind of see where the, the, the chain of revenue may flow through the different agencies. Uh, but this is a historic moment, there's no question. And then I just wanna make a few announcements on uh, upcoming meetings. We are kind of looking like we're getting back to normal, I hope. And so uh, we are a member of the Southeastern Caribbean Disaster uh, Resilience Partnership. Uh, that meeting will be fully online January 26 and 27, talking about you know, the whole region of coastal resilience. And that is gonna be a focus within EPA, looking at large regional resilience. Harbor Branch Science Symposium, February 17th and 18th. Uh, those of you who have time to come to that one day where they do the technical, uh, this is always a great place to see the big suite of research from students to scientists. And, and it really is a, a great place to network. So if you have the time, I really suggest you, you maybe think about spending a day down at Harbor Branch. Um, and in fact, many of you may know, but we helped publish last year's and so that entire symposium is now published in Florida Scientist, but thanks to support from us in a special journal. Uh, we had to postpone our normal annual meeting with the NEPs. Uh, we are combining as a partner, so we are a funding sponsor of this Basis 7 and Association of National Estuary Program meeting. This is gonna be February 28th to March 4th over in St. Pete. This is the Twice a year, all the NEPs get direct, directors get together with EPA. And in this case, we'll be coupling with Tampa Bay Science. Uh, they are experiencing, many of you may not have heard, but seagrass declines are happening in Tampa Bay, Sarasota Bay, Charlotte Harbor. And so they, they don't see it to the extent we do, but they're seeing some shift to, you know, away from expansion to contraction, and that's not good news. And then lastly, um, a project that we were working on that got post postponed because of COVID, uh, we will do a tech surge on April 12th to 14th, looking at marine technology specifically related to some of the things going on with the Indian River Lagoon. That'll be at Harbor Branch, uh, we're a full a sponsor partner on that. And uh, one last item I want to bring up is our RFPs are on the street. So we have five right now, five RFPs, education, uh, water quality, habitat restoration, community engagement and restoration, and science and innovation. So make sure you let everybody know we're, gonna, we're trying to broadcast this far and wide uh, that uh, we've got about a million dollars of local cost share within those five RFPs. And that will set us up uh, for 2023. So you'll get to see those projects, we hope, by the February <coughs> meeting. So that's all I have. Great, anybody have any questions or comments? 
Okay. Our next staff uh, report is going to be from Glenn Torsivia on Executive Director Evaluation. Good afternoon. This will be pretty short. Uh, as you know, it's that time when we have to, you all have to evaluate Dwayne. So the process was that I will send out the evaluation form to each of you, uh, then return it back to me. It'll be a cover memo explaining the process. I'll then compile it into a spreadsheet so you can see what all the scores are. And then at your February meeting, you will vote on it. So other than that, I hope you all had a great Thanksgiving and happy holidays. Thank you, Glenn. Yeah. So we'll be expecting then those mailed to us. Is that okay? Okay. Great. Okay, great. We're moving to member reports. So we'll start down with Aaron. Well, I'll, I'll be brief. I just wanted to touch on our regulatory efforts across the state, uh, not only our district in Central, Southeast, but uh, across the state in implementing Senate Bill 64, which uh, requires elimination of all non-beneficial surface water discharges of, of wastewater effluent. So essentially, um, facilities had until November 1st to provide the department their plan to eliminate uh, their discharges or comply uh, with the provisions of that. So we spent the good part of the, the late summer and then early fall proactively reaching out to them, letting them know about you know, what's required, educating them, and proactively making sure that they uh, hit that mark. And out of uh, 168 uh, facilities, 167 got their plan in uh, by November uh, 1st. So now uh, ne our next step is to review those plans, um, see where um, they either hit the mark, miss the mark, continue to coordinate with those uh, facilities. And uh, you know, some of these facilities are gonna have to do major infrastructure upgrades, uh, you know, go more to public access reuse, uh, do plant upgrades, a number of different things to eliminate these discharges. Uh, and then they're, you know, from uh, 2022, they have 10 years. Uh, so 20, by 2032, uh, goal is all these discharges will be eliminated. So that's, wow. that's what we've been working. That's all I got. Great, thank you. Jackie. Thank you. There are a lot of great things um, happening in the St. Lucie, Martin County area. And so I'm just briefly kind of going to give a, a summary of them because it is so exciting. And uh, so all of you are, pro are familiar with SERP and almost all the components of SERP are in place to happen in Martin and St. Lucie counties at, right now. So for instance, and even more, a very important part of that for me, because it's how I came into all of this, was fighting for the EAA reservoir. So the EAA reservoir, the idea there, which was really supported by uh, Governor DeSantis, is supported by Governor DeSantis, is to open up the, the bathtub, so to speak, to start letting more water go south, because it's hard to have less water in the estuaries uh, going south if there's no place to put it. <laughs> So that is in place, and they got their first contract um, about a month ago to begin that. The, the stormwater treatment area, the district's already working on it. Then within like the last year, uh, in the chaos of everything, uh, C23 and C24 reservoirs and STAs are in place. They're, the land is bought. Uh, there were some issues with the land because of um, natural uh, the native people's re remains were on those lands, and so they had to shift the whole footprint, which was like a tremendous amount of work and time. But that occurred, so now C23, C24, and the, the reservoir and the stormwater treatment area, which is in St. Lucie County, but affects the St. Lucie River and Martin County too, of course, that is in place. To, to it has millions of dollars going forward and it's happening. You may have heard that last week, the first CERT project, uh, C44, uh, the chair was there and others were there, that went online. So that is the first major CERT project. It's taken 20 years, 21 years for that to happen. And the first major project the ribbon was cut right there in Martin County, and that will be taking water out of the C44 canal, cleaning it through the stormwater treatment areas, and then putting it back 
into the C44 canal as it goes to the river. And then last week, as I had to like pinch myself, like, is this really happening? The South Florida Water Management District bought the lands for the C25 reservoir and stormwater treatment area. And that was the same one that Chris, uh, Commissioner Chris Davowski, chair, took us to see getting cleaned last week. So it's really like a miracle. It really is. But what it is, is it's everybody's hard work. It's the movement, the water movement, I believe, that came up out of this East Coast. And um, things are moving forward. And it is awfully sad, all the things like the manatees and we all know the water doesn't always look great, but there is hope on the horizon. That is for darn sure, because now we have the government and I think the, the public in with us to keep moving this ball. And I didn't mean to be so tough on FDEP. I just, I'm sorry, I think all of us together now are, we're really working together uh, through agencies, through local governments, through uh, the people, uh, through the moms and dads, through the grandparents and the grandkids, through the websites, Kathy's commercials, touch people. I mean, people really are getting on board. And if someone had told me that when I got on the South Florida Water Management Board, which I never expect to get on, by the way, um, that it, once I was on that board, that all of SERP, all of SERP would be in place within three years, I would have said, there's no way that can happen. Well, it is happening. And thank you to Governor DeSantis. Thank you to the state legislator. Thank you to all of the presidents we've had recently who have helped bring money to this. And thank you to the, the National Estuary Program and everyone who we're, 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 we're creating a culture, I think. We're creating a culture of the goal of clean water. And we are going to get there. We are going to get there. So, I mean, I'm just so excited I can hardly stand it. <laughs> I think you should work on being more enthusiastic. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, it's I don't get out much. So once I get out of my room, I can't, I can't help myself. Well, we're glad that the excitement is contagious. I don't, I don't really want to follow Jackie. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like my mind's going to be like such a letdown, but I will. Um, it, it is exciting. I've been seeing all that happening, and it is exciting. And I know all your years of being involved in it, it's just got to be like Christmas has come early. Yes. So I can certainly understand that. Um, just real quick, we, uh, Martin, St. Lucie, and Indian River County have a tri-county legislative meeting every year. So we had that um, earlier this month, it's all blurs together. But one of the things that we talked about was the boats and people live aboard boats and the pump outs. And so we are, um, we had come up with kind of a regional policy and approach to seek some legislation there and to put a program in place to address that. So um, just to piggyback on that. Um, more locally, um, the Indian River County, I can finally say, I know I've been kind of updating you guys on this project for, it seems like, a thousand years, but the North County septic to sewer phase two project, like work shovels are in the ground and work has commenced on that. And that is the Roseland and Ursel Dune Heights area. Um, so that's gonna take about 250 houses off of septic. It'll provide um, county water and county sewer. And the, all those houses are directly on the St. Sebastian River or within a block of the lagoon and the Sebastian River. So. That's a fabulous project, yeah. So then we're gonna, now we're gonna move on to, this will be the next project I'll be updating you guys on forever until it happens, but um, we're moving on to our Lost Tree Island Habitat Restoration Project. Um, Lost Tree Islands is a string of spoil islands in the lagoon, so we're gonna go through and do some habitat restoration there, um, and also some water quality work and that type of thing. So it's in the design phase right now, and it's. It's really gonna be, I think, a super cool project, kind of like Jones Pier, but you know, yes. out in the lagoon. So as it moves forward, we'll keep you guys updated. And that's all I got. Great. Commissioner Brower. Thank you. First, Jackie, I, I wanna just recommend that you learn to come out of your skin a little bit and be able to <laughs> express yourself more openly. <laughs> And sometimes no. I need to pull myself back. So. No, no, no. I, I don't think so in this case. And, and your excitement is contagious, and I think it's well-warranted. So I want to speak to the 
the way that we started this meeting to the gentleman in, in the back. I'm doing um, uh, town halls around our county, and I'm hearing exactly what you said, sir, this morning, is it just stop, stop. I've, we, in the first one I did, every person in the room, and it was a full room, said, we don't want any more development, just stop it. There was one person who um, wasn't for that. We all know we're not going to stop development, we're not going to stop growth, but we need to grow responsibly. And I, th I hope that what you'll take from this meeting is there are things happening, and we are serious about it, but what the public can do is to continue to, uh, we, we need the political pressure. You, we need to keep hearing what you want to do, and then as your representatives, and even this board, even the unelected people are your representatives, um, can go to the legislature and get more money. We need more money to do the things that we need to do. We, we've got projects, we've got really smart people that with things to do. It was interesting to hear you say that if you didn't talk about water, you're probably, you didn't get elected if it wasn't a priority. And that is true, and that is encouraging. And I talked about water, not just as a means to get elected, because it was, but because it was in my heart. It's, I see that as the number one um, issue facing the state of Florida. So when I got elected, I was really pleased to find a staff in Volusia County who's already there, who already see that as a priority, who are doing amazing things, and I think that have a good relationship with the St. John's Water Management District. And if, if that's not the case with our county manager, please let me know. Let, let <laughs> so, us know that you, we so, need to come back at you. Absolutely. Good. Um, so I just, with all that in mind, I just want to mention a, a couple things, because we, we've talked about storm order th this morning. Just an update on um, a couple of very important storm order programs. The uh, Gabordi Canal um, uh, is now under construction. Um, the completed project will uh, reduce total nitrogen um, by 5,700 pounds of year, uh, pounds a year, and phosphorus by uh, 1,100 pounds. And then the Aerial Canal Water Quality Improvement, another stormwater um, project is, um, is on schedule. Uh, it's being designed and permitting. Um, please help us with that, permitting. Um, uh, estimated to remove 1,300 pounds a, a year and, and um, 210 pounds of, of phosphorus. A couple uh, grants that were got from our, uh, I call him our uh, Minister of, of Water, um, Michael Ulrich, um, a $5.5 million grant for the Southeast Regional Facility at, at Oak Hill. This is a wastewater uh, treatment plant that will now be advanced 14, did I say thousand? 5.5 million, 14, roughly 15 million for the Southwest Regional um, Wastewater Treatment Plant to have it be ad advanced. Um, that one, the, the Southeast is really important for, for us because that serves Edgewater, Oak Hill, uh, communities that surround the Indian River Lagoon. Part of that project um, will include a pilot um, project for a high heat commercial composting facility so that the biosolids that are produced from that plant can be composted, help us to reduce the, uh, the landfill of, of um, yard debris, um, landscape debris, uh, newspaper, you know, anything that can be composted. Um, I think the state of Florida is requesting that we reduce landfill by 30 percent. So, you know, composting would be a good way. Get rid of the biosolids and then you have a, a living, saleable product at, at the end that could be spread in, instead of uh, um, fertilizers. So I'm, I'm excited about that. Another project that just came up, um, the, I think I mentioned it here before, a BioRock project. If you're not familiar with BioRock, please go online and biorock.org, biorock.com. 
they produce living reef systems that are, this is gonna sound crazy, so you, you gotta go check it out. They're, uh, they have electric current in them. And what that does is stimulates growth on these artificial reefs that are metal. They calcify, protects the metal, and after they calcify, you get um, uh, coral, all, all kinds of living organisms that grow on it, clean the water, protect the coastline, make it more resilient. But what we saw looking at that project for a coastline was that in estuaries and other parts of the world, every place they put one in, it grew seagrass in polluted water. And I can't tell you how. We brought him to the council, and unfortunately the council um, was very interested in it, but voted it down for a pilot because there was no data. And as I understand the scientific method, you've got to do the experiment first, and then you get the data. And it was, uh, so we're, we're pushing ahead with that. We know that everyone ever built grows more seagrass. What we don't know is how much, how far away from the reef. So fortunately, people in the private community, um, marinas, uh, f for example, heard the presentation and they have contacted me and want to help fund some, uh, some project. One in an oyster uh, program because uh, the claim is that it grows oysters bigger and faster, so we're, we're going to see. And another one for um, uh, um, the seagrass. So if we can grow, we, Dr. DeFries is absolutely right. We've got to improve the quality of water to grow seagrass. But if we can start growing seagrass, even in the current state of water, by this method, um, that, I, I think that's part of, the, uh, part of what we should look at, too. So, there are exciting things happening, and, and um, I'm happy to see it. And I thank this board for your effort. For you and your team, I can't say it any better than, than it's already been done. I am so glad to see you back and to see you face-to-face -face instead of uh, on Zoom. Um, I'm not against Zoom, but it's just good to see you. And the work that you do is is Herculean. It's, a, it's amazing and we appreciate it. Thank you, all of you. Thank you. Commissioner Smith. Thank you, Madam Chair. Everybody said it so far, but I'm going to try and be brief. <laughs> I was in D.C. a couple of weeks ago and I usually go one, once or twice a year representing us and Brevard County and I haven't been there for a year and a half because of COVID. And just briefly using that word again, I, I want to tell you that D.C. is a different place now. There's very few people up there. And they say that when I was there, it was crowded compared to what it's been the last year and a half. Their tourism is way, way down. But what I found most interesting was when I went to the House of Representatives, I had to wear a mask. No surprise. But when I went to the Dirksen building to see Senator Rubio, they don't have a mask policy. So just to tell you, things are different in D.C. Um, to Jackie and Doug, you were talking about Florida today and giving people notice and how important it is for us to toot our own horn because the general public doesn't think that we're doing anything. They don't see anything being done. They know that they're paying taxes. And you folks all know that in 2016, Brevard County passed the half-cent sales tax. We do a lot of projects, but we don't get a lot of publicity. And a perfect example is when I was gone to D.C. two weeks ago, uh, we completed our 50th project. It was a $2.6 million stormwater project, and it was a big deal. Uh, it was right near my house. It was There's a creek that's about three doors away from my house that flows into the Indian River, and that's been a major source of irritation for me because every time we see a heavy rain, I see grass clippings and leaves floating into the water because it's coming out from the subdivisions that are on both sides of that creek. Well, this stormwater project has eliminated that, $2.6 million. Florida Today didn't show up. TV stations didn't show up. So you do these projects, and there were a lot of people there, and no publicity at all. So we have to do a better job of beating our own horns 
calling these people directly. I know I talked to our communications director and he said, well, commissioner, I notified them. Well, that's not going to be enough. The commissioners are going to have to start pounding on these people and telling them that you're in the news business. You've got to get the news out. And this is important news because it affects everybody. The, this lagoon, as everybody here knows, is extremely important to the well-being of this entire area. So it's, it's on us. So that's it. So I wasn't real brief, but I tried to be. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. yeah, a couple of quick things. One, one, Jackie and I were at the groundbreaking ceremony for the Evans Bluefield Water Farm. Yes. And yes, that was it, awesome. It, uh, it's a, an old citrus grove of 6,000 acres. And you, you, a lot of people can't visualize 6,000 acres. Like, to give you some visuals, Disneyland in California is on 180 acres. Disney World is on the Bronson Ranch, which is 26,000 acres. So this is one, one quarter the size of Disney World. And when you see a tree line to tree line, that amount of water, is, is four or five feet deep, is not going to go to the Indian Lagoon anymore. And just that one project. It, and that's just the beginning of, of some more projects that uh, Jackie rattled off all of them. Uh, that are going on, but when you see a visual like that, and, this, and it's so massive, uh, it's really rewarding to see that, and to see the, you know, visualize the water that's not going to bludgeon the animals in the lagoon anymore. It's going to be evaporated off or utilized other ways. Uh, but the the big picture, still for me, the biggest bang for all of our buck is connecting the two districts. You know when when. All of these projects in Martin, St. Lucie, and Indy River County that just hold water, that eventually, if we do get even get wetter, they have to discharge to the lagoon. The one project that allows Drew Bartlett and, and St. John's to work together to move the water north-south rather than east when we have to discharge, we can move it north-south with reconnecting all the way to Jacksonville. It gives the, the water districts more ability to exit that water anywhere else but the lagoon. We can move it south back into, into South Florida, we can move it north into the St. John's, wherever we need it, that valuable asset, we can put it with that reconnection up to about 100, 120,000 acre feet. Wow. And that, that's, um, that's another visual, but uh, that's, that's about four inches on Lake Okeechobee, the biggest freshwater lake uh, in Florida. So it, it's a significant amount of water that we're going to take away from, again, hurting the animals in the lagoon. So that reconnection, I'm pushing as hard as I can for. Uh, I think it's the, and, and I, I wouldn't put Duane on the spot, but I think it's the most important single project for the health of the lagoon to divert water north-south that I know of. And I, I know Jackie's working from her end, I'm working on my end. I know her executive director, mine is. Uh, we have a new one, Mike Register, who's excellent, by the way, uh, and he gets this. So hopefully we'll reconnect the districts, and that would be the big prize to me for the lagoon, uh, for, for the state of Florida and the lagoon. So I, I think that's, that's just great. And the last thing, for Christmas, all I want is to see Dwayne paddling onto the surfboard again on about a six-foot glassy day. I think we would all love to see that for Christmas yeah, and, and no, echo some of the board members' comments. You have worked so tremendously hard, the entire staff. So uh, thank you so much for all the hard work that you do each and every day. And um, on to Doug's visual, I recently got to take a, um, with the intent of going to look at Palmar and some of the um, challenges we're facing there, a helicopter tour of Martin County, and to see the magnitude of some of these projects that are coming to fruition, C-40, that was prior to the uh, ribbon cutting and the filling of C-44, but it was just amazing to see it from the air and to see all the, um, the con new connection from some of our Loxahatchee restoration, to see that winding river and Alapata, to see some of that from the air, and I would encourage you, Jackie, to yes. take that aerial tour because it was the uh, Martin County Sheriff's Department. So we will definitely connect you because it gives you a whole new perspective on some of the accomplishments that we've made. Um, and I wanted to um, 
you mentioned that there's hope on the horizon. I think we were all excited about C44 and the ribbon cutting and to see those ginormous pumps turned on just felt like a 20 years, you know, plus sense of accomplishment. And that was fantastic. I, do, I just have to, sh I'll share with you, but hopefully so everybody else can hear this. So the reservoir she's talking about, it's two and a half miles across and two and a half miles long. So that's big. Yeah. And you, you really have no sense of it, you know, while you're on the ground. And it's six, and everybody can say 60,000 acre feet of storage. Yeah. But when you see it, it is just um, magnificent. And to see those pumps come on was really, you know, an amazing, amazing culmination of efforts um, for many, many years. And um, Martin County had a, a huge team for LOSEM, we had consultants and uh, we, we really advocated and hard to um, have zero discharges for the lake. And although we don't, you know, we didn't get exactly what we wanted, um, the schedule that they chose will re reduce significantly. And um, during, I think, peak seasons, um, 50 to 60 percent reduction and there are many many weeks out of the year that we will get zero discharges so again we you know, we had a huge team of consultants working on that and I can't thank them enough because I think they moved the ball and I think Jackie's right that there's a lot of hope on the horizon for that and some really exciting news we spoke earlier about Martin County's 10-year 10 10,000 septic to sewer removal program our board a couple years ago um, really committed um, and was resolute and committed a lot of funding from our board to remove 10,000 septic tanks over the next 10 years. And we have made quite a bit of progress. Um, we have been very successful at the state level in getting grants, and I want to thank DEP. We just um, received about $18 million in additional DEP grants to move forward our septic to sewer uh, program. And again, you know, I can't credit staff enough because we put together a, a very aggressive program um, with the Connect to Protect, which we saw the presentation last meeting, and um, the board is resolute in funding that program so we can get these um, these houses off of septic. So um, with that, that's all I have, and I want to wish everybody, um, from my perspective, a happy holidays as well. And is anybody, we, we did updates down here. So with that, our next meeting is going to be Friday, February 11th, and that will be here in the chambers in the uh, city of Sebastian. And I wish everybody a very happy holiday season. Thank you. Merry Christmas.